This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Welcome to the show. I've got an amazing episode to share with you because you'll be hearing from Cam Lee. Cam was in the proto-death outfit alongside the late great Chuck Schuldiner, a group called Mantis, and he was also in a very early version of Death. He recorded vocals and drums on a bunch of rehearsal tapes and demos, and you can hear him sing in a style which should be considered the very first example of the death metal vocal technique. Yes, I absolutely agreed with Jeff Becerra and his sentiments when I had a chat to him that it was indeed Jeff who is the originator of the death metal vocal style. However, I've rethought this because if you go back and have a listen to the Mantis demos and those death rehearsal tapes and demos, Cam's voice has all of the characteristics of the death metal technique as it is still deployed today. Whereas I feel as though Jeff's voice is similar to Max Cavalera's in that it is absolutely an example of an extreme metal vocal technique, but it's just not quite a death metal vocal styling. Now when Cam and Chuck went their separate ways, and have a listen to the reasons that Cam provides for their split, Cam went on to form Massacre. The group has been mired in lineup shifts and interpersonal issues, but Cam is the captain of the good ship Massacre nowadays, and he's forged a new album called Resurgence, with an exceptional cast of musicians which is indeed the catalyst for this conversation. So in this chat, Cam talks all about his trials and tribulations, and I want to thank him for his candor and honesty. I enjoyed hearing what Cam had to say, so I hope you enjoy listening to the episode, because it's an absolute cracker. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Mr. Cam Lee. We, we made it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the wonders of, uh, well, I can't say Trans-Pacific, because you're in Florida, I think, aren't you? So yeah. uh, trans, uh, trans global, international, internationally connectable uh, telepresence via omni channel and uh, time differences and all the rest of it. But all good. Yeah, but here. you're in the future. You're in the future. So you had to send a message to the past. Yeah, it's very so. strange like that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I know. It's crazy that uh, that we're able to do these sort of things. I've been doing this long enough to have experienced the. The transition from Skype to Zoom, where Skype nobody really did video, so it's so cool to be able to see people when we're having these sorts of conversations too. You know, how's everything been for you so far? Oh, good. It's good. It's uh, you know, it's uh, still crazy COVID stuff, but I mean, other than that, it's 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 good. Mm. Uh, Florida is still one of the states that's that's got the highest. Uh, you know, hospitalizations and stuff like that. And I just watched the report this morning that said uh, more people died this year than last year. And I was actually surprised at that. That was, a, that was a surprise. I was like, Oh, wow, it seemed like more people died last year. And I knew a couple of people that died. Actually, I think we're playing a tribute show uh, next year. Um, I think in April, I'm not exactly sure of the date up in New York for a friend of ours that had passed away from COVID. Sorry to hear. Yeah. 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 Look, it's, you've probably seen the news reports here. We are locked down. So COVID hasn't gone through the communities because of what's going on, but there's some massive issues surrounding our uh, basic human rights and freedom of movement. Um, yeah, yeah. Particularly in the state of Victoria, which closely resembles in terms of politics, the states of New York and California, but far more left. And okay. you're even seeing people that are t- typically aligned with what we call the green left coming out and saying, I think we've gone a bit too far here, guys. And and I think that's absolutely the case, to be quite frank. And it's, it's very unfortunate that, you know, we've got two pandemics in Australia. We've got COVID, but then we've got this shadow pandemic of mental illness and suicide and all this other shit that's going on. And yeah, it's, I hope we come out of it, mate, but I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to take for us to come out of something that's been as serious as this. I know it's just weird how it's just uh, for the world. Uh, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere I talk to people, it's just, it's like some people it, just say it's so surreal. It doesn't feel like it's real. Like some people say it's like living a TV show. And I, I, I think we've been living a TV show since 9-11, to be honest with you. I remember the, the morning waking up at 9-11 going, is this fucking real? 
It's just, I'm like, I was like scratching my head and it just seems like, like reality has just been warped since then. And I think, you know, I mean, I'm not going to get into a whole po- political discussion with you and stuff like that, but I mean, as our leaders have been playing with our, our wait, our owners, I shouldn't say leaders, yeah. our owners have been playing with us that's for a point. long time, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's such uh, a good point. Hey, talk about politics. If you want on my show, you're free to talk about anything you both want. <laughs> So go ahead, but um, I know. Look, I, I really appreciate you you accepting my connection request on this one here because I've been. I've got to say, I've been a fan for a long time. You're one of those blokes who's intrigued me for decades. I've got to say because of your involvement with Chuck and the whole debate around who created the death metal vocal style. Because you get right. left out of that discussion, but you are one of the the, the originators of the whole well, thing. I mean, people people now are starting to recognize and call me the Godfather of the growl or yeah. stuff like that, which which is. Uh, I appreciate that. But yeah, I mean, um, I've got my theories of why it was uh, done that way. I mean, I'm not obviously Caucasian and this is the South. I mean, I don't want to like throw a race card out there, but I mean, Mm -hmm. a lot of it, I dealt with it myself uh, for years. I dealt with it in my own band. I, and uh, I was like uh, back, back in the day, I, I would, I would feel kind of, pushed in the corner because I would get like these, I mean, and the, the, the proof is out there. It's not like something I'm making up because the, I, I found that somebody had put a, um, a rehearsal, a de- old, old death rehearsal mm-hmm. out on YouTube and you can hear Rick basically, you know, racially ripping into me, but you know, I used to be one of those people. I used to like, just take it, take it on the shoulder. I'm like, I've heard it, I've heard it all my life. And I, I just take it and like, like water off a duck's back. But then I started realizing later in the years, as, as I got out there and I started doing all these other bands, like working with Scandinavian guys and stuff like that. And they would say the same thing, like, man, what, why are you so pushed back? And I'm like, let me tell you a story of something that happened in 1987. And I'm telling you now. And uh, I've told this many times before in 1987, when we were a massacre, we went on our self tour. We weren't signed yet. We went up to New York city on a self. We went from Florida, a self tour. We did it ourselves. We didn't have any backing. And the main reason we went up to uh, New York was to talk to Road Racer Records at the time. Hmm. And uh, they had just signed Sepultura, I think. And uh, um, they were signed, just signed Obituary. So we thought, you know, this was a chance for finally us to get signed. And this is before the guys quit and joined Death and Leprosy and all that. This is the 1987. So this is the second year into Massacre. Hmm. Um, and it was myself, Rick Roz. We had Robbie Goodwin on second guitar at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Terry Butler just just to join and Billy Andrews. We all went on, you know, self tour going up the East Coast, got to New York, went into the office to meet Roadrunner Records. And uh, I remember meeting Con- Monty Connor, who at the time was just working in the office at the time. And we went to meet who was running the office at the time. And we were kind of like given the cold shoulder. And I remember a person in the office. I don't remember his name. I can't tell you uh, the guy's name, but I remember him coming out and asking me in front of the entire band. He's like, Hey, what are you? And I was like, what do you mean? What am I? He's like, well, what, what, you know, what ethnicity are you? I I said, Hey, I'm Pacific Islander, Asian and an, an Irish. If you want to, you know, that's, that's my mix. I'm mixed. And he's like, you should tell people you're Hispanic. Cause we just signed simple tour and they're going to be big. You should tell people you're from South America. And I, I felt like, man, that was the most racist thing he could have said to me. I was like, you know, that was really kind of like racial. And then he, as we were leaving, he kind of said, you know, you really should think about telling people that you're Hispanic because people aren't going to follow an Asian singer with four or five white guys. And he said that to me. I mean, it was insulting. And we left. And then we, ne- we didn't get signed. We didn't talk to nobody. And Monty Connor felt so bad because I know he said, well, man, I feel bad. Let me take you guys out for pizza. And I was like, wow, that was that really like that struck a chord with me. And I'm like, wow, I couldn't believe that that was in 1987. But there was other bands out there. But I think it was because because people say there was, de- you know, uh, bands like um, uh, Death Angel were out there. And I'm like, yeah, well, Death Angel is the entire band was filipino they're all Mm. cousins you know it's kind of more of a thing where it's a i hate to say it's a gimmick but it was kind of it was almost a gimmicky thing you know here's a bunch of asian guys filipino guys together in a band sacrifice all the guys up in the you know up there they were all um from canada you know 
and then you know you had asian bands like loudness and stuff like that out of japan yeah. and the other bands were coming out of japan but it was like the entire band so it was kind of weird to see and it felt like he was half true partially right but it was the timing it was 1987 so yeah i took that and i was like i just buried it you know i said ah, i'm not gonna worry but then as years passed and years later came upon me i was like I wonder if that really had something to do with it. I wonder if my race actually had something to do with keeping me down in a kind of a way. Then it got, you know, the world has gotten more acceptable and more open now, um, mm. especially since the internet. So I don't think it's now, it's now it's not an issue, but I really do think because it was such an early time frame and it was still the eighties back then. I mean, hell people still thought, you know, you could get spit on and get AIDS. When I remember, I remember it was so bad. People were like, oh, my God, if he's got HIV or they, they just call it AIDS, he'll spit on you. There were cops were like wearing gloves to just handle, talk, you know, perpetrators because they were afraid they were going to get AIDS. You know, oh, God, the guy's got AIDS. You know, I could get it on me if I touch him. That's how bad it was. So there was this whole paranoid time back then. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's what it was, but I've always kept that and wondered is possibly my race is a reason. I don't know. I'm, I'm actually just perplexed too. But the fact is I have been back since back then. And there has been people that have come out like, uh, you know, Barney from Napalm Death has, mm -hmm. has mentioned many times as me being an influence. Dave Ingram will tell you straight out. I'm really good friends with Dave Ingram. And he'll tell you straight yes. out. Yep. Yeah. Mm. So I don't know. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's part of a, a, very broad topic, this one here, because I've, I've spoken to Vernon Reed out of Living Colour about this topic, about this perception that, that and, you know, excuse me for saying this like this, because we're all just people, but so-called people of colour, yeah. the perception that you can't play rock and metal has been there right. for, for decades, right? And I, I got into music at a time when some of my biggest bands growing up, 24-7 Spies, all black guys with one white drummer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Living Colour, of course. King's X, mm -hmm. Doug Pinnock, and, and probably my favourite band from my youth, Fishbone, who were a ragged yes. thrash band at times. I thought that was fairly normal, and and but I discovered being I'm a you can see the bass guitars behind me, Fishbone, yeah, mm -hmm. Norwood Fisher, one of the key reasons I got into it. Same with the guys in Living Cully. You know, I just love that sort of driving those driving prominent mm -hmm. bass lines, and a lot of that comes from black music, as you know. But yes, and I also think I've got to say I think in Australia we're a bit more open minded. We don't have that insistence on diving deep into the identity of somebody courtesy on the way that they visually represent or present sorry i should say it's about the character and about the person i've got i've always felt that way about us as australians i know plenty of people would disagree with me can believe me especially people want to highlight some of the issues that we still have with our indigenous community aboriginal australians mm -hmm. um but i think ultimately you get you're going to have to you're going to have to look very far and wide to find a genuine racist in Australia. We, we've, we've always been, my wife is Filipino. So okay, it's, it's very fucking normal, mate, to have mixed households in Australia. There's this idea, I think, mm -hmm. that we're a homogenous culture. We ain't. We're the most multicultural nation on earth. So that's, that's beside the point. But I think when you're talking about your contribution and how unfairly marginalized you were, mate, it's a fucking disgrace. If it comes down to your, uh, who you are for something that, okay, for starters, who chooses what race they are, and B, mm -hmm. it's about your contribution. And the fact of the matter, myself, doing the research that I've done, and God knows long-term listeners of the podcast will know, I consider myself schooled on these subjects. I don't say things and I don't espouse opinions that I haven't researched thoroughly, but they are still opinions, but they're rooted in fact, if you like. And without you, Cam, the genre doesn't evolve the way it does afterwards. Do you understand? So if you hadn't yes. done what you did back in the day with Mantis, with Death, if you hadn't inspired Chuck the way that you did, he wouldn't have been, I mean, D Death, of course, you know, we talk about the genesis, then we talk about people who popularise genres. Death, of course, popularised right. the genre. But you were there at the very beginning, the embryonic beginning, when the cells were dividing and multiplying and becoming the, the fully forged beast like it is on the mask there over your left hand shoulder. Yeah. So <laughs> you 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 and that's why we had that exchange about writing your book too, because I think your story is crucial. I think it is very important and I think it needs to be out there. And you are one of the genuine godfathers. So I, I hope that moving forward, mate, that you get your just you on that front. I hope so too. And I mean, I appreciate you uh, offering the help. And I think too, I mean, there's more that I just gave a little bit, 
you know, of, of one, I think there's a lot of factors. Um, why? Um, one is, is the, the race thing, but I mean, that's just a small fraction of the, the other part, you know, and of course this isn't me trying to slander or is it slander as slander is when it's written. So it's liable. Uh, <laughs> it's not me trying to be liable or on anybody. Uh, this is just an opinion, mm. but my opinion is that uh, when um, uh, Eric Greif or grief, yeah, which is what he gives me. Death uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, took over. Uh, took over after Chuck's passing, unfortunately. That uh, they needed to martyrize Chuck in a way because um, it, it kind of would elevate him to the mm. level that they needed to elevate death. Because I mean, I knew I knew Chuck in the end as well. I wasn't like hanging out and talking to him, but I mean, we were aware. Everybody was aware of each other, and I remember. Death wasn't popular till after Chuck did. It, it's like the popularity of Chuck was post mortem, and um, it, it's 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 kind of like this factory kind of like thing that happened, you know, when relapse kind of took over and started reissuing everything, and then Eric was pushing stuff. But it's like it's like when you have a hero, obviously what they they sold Chuck as to make a hero better, give him a good villain. And I've been that villain. I've been villainized by Eric Greif um, and uh, and Terry Butler. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Terry Butler and Eric Greif, Eric Greif is Terry Butler's manager. He has been for years. Right. All the way going all the way back to the spiritual healing time. So um, and then was manager of Massacre during that time that Terry and Rick was we were doing it. So what better way to just completely make the heroes that they, they wanted to be by villainizing me, which is fine. I don't mind. I'm, I do death metal. It's like, that's perfect to be a villain. Hey, I, I, you know, I'll be your Joker to your Batman. But I mean, uh, it's like, I didn't mind that part uh, of being vil vilified. But you know, I mean, if you're going to vilify me, vilify me for the truth, vilify me for the reasons, you know, not for this, you know, make believe stuff that you want to create just so you can martyrize someone to make a dollar bill, which is what they were doing. And it's, it's sad. I mean, there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes, stuff that people don't know. Like I said, the book is very important. Things like I had to do, um, like uh, get, I had to get legal representation because I was being completely ripped off. I wasn't seeing anything for anything. And I had to get a lawyer to set, to, to set things right. Of course, it's, they settled out of court. Um, I, was, I, I tried to sue Relapse and, and try to sue Eric Gray for the release, re-release, which and Rick for the re-release of Mantis. They settled out of court. They came to an agreement out of court. They didn't want it to go all the way. Um, so I, I settled with it. My man, my well, my manager, my uh, lawyer said it's probably best to do this because if you take it all the way to court, by the time you get done, you'll be broke. So <laughs> yeah. like, I was yeah. like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll settle then. I'll settle out of court and go for that. So that's literally the funny thing that I'm trying to get to. The point is I've never seen a royalty check from anything ever, not even the earache stuff. Jesus. I've never seen a royalty check all these years, still haven't seen a royalty check, but I do see royalty checks from relapse only after I sued them. <laughs> it took, it took me getting a lawyer to get royalty checks from relapse. And so I do get some kind of royalty check from the mantis stuff, but uh, the, the yeah, year I seen... so funny. Too. Sorry, you go. You go. Uh, no, I was just, yeah, that, well, I was just going to say, it's, it's funny that I get royalty checks from Mantis, but I never get anything from, from Massacre. Massacre. But there's a reason behind that. There's a reason. I mean, a lot of people on Eric will probably tell you that, you know, Eric's a, whatever. Um, according to Eric, now, because the, they won't hide paperwork from you, we're still in the red. And I'm, I'm always like, how are we still in the red after 35 yeah, years, or 30 years? How's yeah. the album been out for 30 years and we're still in the red? It's a classic That's album, too. It's sold, mate. You know it's sold. Yeah. You're globally recognized. There's no yeah. way it's not. You've not recouped. There's no way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's their excuse. Their excuse is it's still in the red. But then again, and, the, you know, I don't know for a fact. I mean, I can see, I can see it in paperwork and stuff. Um, these are the, the I'm not, again, I'm not talking about people or bringing things up that, that isn't, you know, legally, can, you can find out. Um, when I talked to Eric and I looked at the paperwork and I asked, Hey, can I see what the paperwork is? It took them forever to send it, but they finally did send it. Mm -hmm. I got uh, statements uh, in emails and there's a lot of loans that supposedly Rick was taking out behind our backs. Um, 
why Eric paid these loans, I have no idea. They were advances, according to Eric. They were advances, and we I didn't even know that he was doing this kind of stuff. So oh, there's over thirty three. Yeah, there's yeah. over thirty three thousand dollars in advances that are owed. Um, so, <laughs> so I wonder why they why would they? So it's your band, and okay, I understand that other band members have a different perspective on it. We'll talk about that in a sec, if that's okay, mm-hmm. because I know that you had to sue Rick and uh, Terry, or yeah, or right. maybe not sue them, or what well, you had you had to go through the courts, as you say, or you had to go. Yeah, I had some, to go. I had to go. Yeah, I had yeah. to go through a court system. So what what would they give him money if he's not uh, the band leader? Well, You're the band leader. Yeah, uh, well, back then, um, when when the earache contract was all set in motion, I was naive. I didn't know, you know, I had never been in, in any kind of business like that. So I signed, which I thought was, hey, you're getting a record contract. Here you go. Sign on the dotted line. Didn't have a lawyer look at it. I mean, we were poor kids. I didn't, you know, I couldn't afford yeah. it. I was at like early twenties. I, I, I didn't trusting. know anything. So I was just like, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, kind of realized that when later on, as I got my lawyer involved, that uh, I didn't really have any rights. And what I had signed away was all my publishing rights and it all belonged to Rick. So everything belonged to Rick. Mm. Yeah. It, it was one of those, one of those things where he signed, so he would basically collecting all the money and, and speaking for the band himself. And he signed it on like that. Um, so, so that's what, that's what it was. It was like, it was like that. Uh, I didn't know, but I, you know, I do know personally from Digby from earache that he hates, you know, he's, he's, he, last time he talked to me was very brief. He goes, look, I hate Rick more than you do. I was like, oh, okay. I mean, I don't hate Rick, but okay. You, you That's what Digby told me because I hate Rick more than you. I was like, oh, okay. So I don't know. Uh, there's also some hatred there between those two. So I have no idea on that end. But you've had, um, you have had moments where you've, you've sort of reconnected with Rick over the years and you've actually tried to forge the, the massacre brand with him um, yeah. through periods of time. So it's, 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 do you guys just not see eye to eye on things? Is that what is sort of keeping you guys apart, so to speak? Um, I think the best way to answer that is in 2010 through 2014, Rick and Terry did Massacre without me. I wasn't involved. And um, it still failed. Yeah. And then according, according to Terry Butler, and it's a blabbermouth article, which I'm sure you could pull up, mm-hmm. it was all Rick's fault. Um. You know, I, I don't want to go on record saying something that nobody else has already said. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, what I felt through through Rick is uh, is a character for sure. Um, he's done things that are questionable. I don't have proof. I, and again, I'm, I guess I'm not trying to be liable or say something that I don't have proof for. But there yeah, you're just there talking. Was, you're expressing an opinion. I understand. Yeah, there were just there yeah. was incidences where. Um, things were being done that I didn't feel uh, were trustworthy. Um, I didn't feel I could, uh, I, I could rely on this person to have m- not only the band's best interest, but my best interest and other members' best interest. And this is a conversation I actually came across when Rick finally left in 2019, because we got back, he got mm. back in touch with me to try to get Massacre back together. So we started in the late 2007 or early 2017, Went through the thing which I call the name wars because that was when Terry Butler tried to claim, oh, I own the name and me yeah. and Billy own the trademark. And I, I had got my lawyer involved on that one. And um, we went through a whole process of that. And a lot of people say, don't, you know, read on the internet. We were called Massacre X. We were called Gods of Death. There's all this stuff, but people don't really know the truth. The reason why we were called Massacre X is because right after Terry uh, pretty much put the cock block on us or the <laughs> cease to desist. Oh, you can't do it. Um, you can't call yourselves massacre because we own the trademark that put a bunch of promoters into a panic mode because we had started booking. We had already started began booking shows and um, promoters were like, Oh crap, we don't want to lose our money. Well, Eric Greif. And again, this is my assumption was sending cease and desist orders to all these promoters in name of Terry saying you cannot book these guys called massacre um i'm putting a cease and desist if you further go further we'll sue you which is something that he he's famously loves to say um 
so promoters were panicking. They were like contacting me back and saying, um, we, we, we can't book you as massacre. And I was like, okay, let me get my, I got in touch with my lawyer. My lawyer said, look, let's, let's go through the process. Let's figure this out. And four days after that, my lawyer got back in touch with me and said, uh, they don't own the trademark. And I said, well, uh, what's going on then? He said, they registered for the trademark two days after you guys announced getting back together. So we announced that we were back together in December 12th. God, I have all this dates. Remember, December 12th of uh, 2016 is when I went over for a meeting and Rick put on blabbermouth that I was back in Massacre, which that was crazy in itself. Um, it was just a meeting, and, but it was all over blabbermouth. And then on December 16th is when the counter uh, article or whatever on Blabbermouth came where Terry Butler saying Cam and Rick cannot call themselves. Mad. It's so petty. It's so childish. Anyways, uh, at this point, um, that's when I got in touch with my lawyer. My lawyer looked and he found out that they registered for the trademark on December 14th. So two days after the December 12th uh, announcement was when they registered. Mm-hmm. Basically, you you can register for any name. You could tomorrow. You could go. You know, I like the name Purple. I'm going to go try to get the to own the the name the word Purple. And you can just go to any trademark, and you're in Australia, or in the states, wherever, and register for it. It doesn't. I think it costs maybe forty dollars to register, at least in the states. It costs forty dollars to register for any word you want. But then it has to go through a process. It's got to go through a all. It's got to go before a judge, which is this is the United States. So anything that's the government is going to take time. So it took literally almost nine months before a judge even looked at it. Once a judge looks at it and says, OK, this guy wants to own the name Massacre. Then it goes through a thing where it has to be contested. And they go up from four to six months where anyone could come in in that time frame to say, no, I want to own that name. It's my turn to kind of show you why I want to own that name. And then they, they have to show that they're going to use it in commerce or they're going to use it for whatever purposes. Same thing I did. Mm-hmm. Well, I had to go through all that process of waiting for the judge to finally look at it. And then the process of waiting for the time for the for anyone to contest it. Then once all that's done, which that was over a year, then it has to go through the process of the courts where you pay court fees and then you it goes through the process of being it literally took almost two years. It took one year and eight months to go through the entire process. So through an entire year of 2017 and the front almost, basically I finally got the trademark since you're on video. (laughs) There you go. Black and white right there. There's the seal of approval, everything. So I got the trademark on in November, 2018. Mm -hmm. Finally got it. It's my name, so got it. But it went through a process. So during all that time, when it was going through the process, they were juggling names around. And uh, the first thing was Massacre X was the first thing thrown because at the time we had Michael Grimm, who was the bass player in The End, which was the band that Rick Roz had after Massacre. The bass player was playing with us for a while. He was the one that came up with the Massacre X. He's like, just put an X at the end. And I was like, why? He goes, well, it's the... X stands for the, it's the Roman numeral for 10. And according to this guy, it was the 10th iteration of Massacre. I said, okay, whatever, whatever gets us. As, well, as soon as that went out, the promoter still said, no, we were getting ceased and desist orders saying that you can't be called Massacre anything. Like literally that's how far they were going. They, we, you know, like there's bands like Massacre, like there's puts uh, AD at the end of their name or yeah. ink at the end of the name. They didn't want us to do any of that. So the promoter in Germany was like, Hey, why don't you just guys call yourself gods of death? This was a promoter in Germany. The, uh, the promoter from Protzen, I believe, was the one that came mm-hmm. up with this. And I was like, fine, gods of death it is. I went home that day, drew up a logo, and we started going by gods of death for, I think, maybe two months. That was it, two-month time, we were gods of death. And all of a sudden, the sh- promoters just stopped. Nope, no more bookings. And the thing is, they didn't want to book gods of death. Nobody knows who Gods of Death is. I know how the business works. Promoters look at it. They say, Massacre is a name that can sell. Gods of Death, nobody knows who the fuck Gods of Death is. And it doesn't care. It doesn't matter that Cam Lee and Rick Ross are in Gods of Death. You guys don't have any, anything out. And promoters kept actually writing back saying, but you call yourself Massacre, we'll do it. 
so it was kind of hard. I was in that process of like, I wanted to tell them, uh, wait, because <laughs> I'm trying to get the name, but I didn't. My lawyer suggested don't say anything. My lawyer was like, just stay quiet. Don't say anything because, you know, it is the world of the Internet. And if it gets out there, it's going to be, you yeah. know, people are going to know that you're trying to get the name. Mm -hmm. So I basically stayed quiet. I just took my lawyer's advice and just kept my mouth shut. And we went through this whole year. 2018 was just like a, this year where we just didn't do anything. We, uh, but it was also a year that was kind of enlightening, too, because in that whole year, Rick didn't write a damn song, anything. And I figured I've been working with guys that were writing songs, could write an album in, in a weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working with Rogus for 15 years. So I've worked with and that. That guy's a riff machine. So yeah. I, I wasn't used to going a whole year without any new music being written and um we started we finally got the name long story short we got the name in november of 2018 and then finally we could book ourselves as massacre and we started booking shows again finally as massacre and we went out and played shows and this was with rick rick was in the band rick and mass but by that time the shows got booked we did our first show in orlando which i thought went really well um as each show progressed it just got worse and worse. And this is an opinion. Mm -hmm. I think an opinion of uh, my opinion is I don't think Rick cared anymore at that point to him. He just, it was just, it was just, Hey, it's a party. It's a show. Let me go out. Let me get drunk. Let me get high. I don't care. And it really came across live and it was coming across where his performance was just awful. He was forgetting how to play the songs. I mean, there's videos out there that are on the internet now on YouTube yeah. that show that he was just messing up everywhere. And we, me and Mike Borders took him to the side and I was backstage with him and I said, look, I don't care if you get drunk, if you get high, whatever you do after the show. I don't care what you do. If you get so drunk, we have to carry you back to the hotel room, fine. But just don't do it before the show. Mm -hmm. And his answer was, well, nobody complained. And I'm like, well, well, you know, we're trying to be professional here and you're acting like this is like a like a garage band, like it's the teenage years, like you're just reliving your teenage years. You don't care to even have integrity. I said, but you have to look at other people. You have to take other people into consideration. It's not just the, it's not just you, Rick. It's not just the Rick Ross show. You know, it's just like I'm here. I'm trying to be professional. We got Mike Borders, you know, back in the band after 30 years. He's trying to take it as be professional. Um, and Mike Borders doesn't have to do this. Uh, he's actually a very well off on his own. He builds homes. He builds houses. OK, so it's, it's not like he's like a, a poor guy. You know, he's very well off, um, you know, millionaire. You know, so it's like he doesn't even have to do this. He just does it because he wants to do it. And it's 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 for him. It's it's also kind of way to get back because he was unfairly kicked out back then. Mm -hmm. um, just so Billy could have his best friend join the band which is Terry Butler, mm -hmm. who didn't even know how to play bass when he joined. It was so bad. He didn't even know how to play. He was on the, when we did that tour I told you about in 87, he was just there on stage mocking that he was playing. He wasn't playing. Oh, we shit. turned him down. Yeah, he, he was turned down. He was, his amp wasn't even turned on. His amp was on or and his volume was turned down. He just was uh, air, air guitaring, just to pretend. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, a lot of a lot of secrets yeah. that people don't know. I've got I could tell you so much. Even like uh, I mean, I, I think I've told this many times many stories before, but you know, a lot of people say, Oh, well, Rick Ross is massacre. Well, a lot of people will be surprised that Rick didn't play all the guitars on From Beyond. There's two other guitar players on From Beyond that were never credited. Walt Thrashler is one of the guitar players, and I believe it's uh it's either Francis or Moses, one of the guys from the old band Incubus. He played he played some guitar solos on that album. And then when I tell people that, they're like, yeah, I can kind of tell it's not all Rick. I'm like, yeah, because Rick didn't Jesus play him all Christ. everything. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's all what uncredited yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of stuff that a lot of people don't. Another thing, too, um, that that album came up so quickly uh, because we had two weeks to do that album. Um because Billy and Terry had just got kicked out of death because they went on that spiritual healing tour without Chuck. Yeah. And they got kicked out. We had uh massacre. was still back together. We were working on stuff. We had, it was during the second coming. So we had Joe Cangelosi drummer and Butcher Gonzalez was the bass player. And we did a demo, which the second coming 
demo that's out everywhere now um, that uh, we did that as a promo. It was just a studio live studio promo. So earache records could hear the material. And I remember Digby, uh, he refused it. He hated it. He's like, no, this is not what I wanted. I wanted the old massacre. I don't want this shit. So we were like uh, taken back by that phone conversation. And then Digby said, oh, by the way, did you know that uh, Bill and Terry are no longer in death? They got kicked out. And we were like, no. And he says, I think you guys should put the band back together. It was his him questioning or saying that, but he had already put it in mind. That's what he was doing because he had already contacted Terry Butler about it. And the next thing I know, they're back in the band. But we have two weeks before we go into the studio to record. And it was all kind of like rushed and we rushed in. And I remember one of the things and a lot of people I, I tell people this now and they're like, ah, crap, I, I love that album. But now that I listen to it, I can tell um, one of the things is it, the album tempo goes all over the place. Mm. It's, it's very raw. I think it's raw. But one of the reasons is, is um, Billy refused to play the drums only once. He, did, he said he tracked the drums once and he wouldn't play them again. He said he did the song and he said, that's it. I'm not playing again. You have to deal with what you got. Uh, it was like kind of like a dickish thing to do, but he was like, I, I played the song and, and that's, that's how it's going to be. I'm not retracking it. So like songs like cryptic realms, the tempos all over the place. It's up and down. It's got different tempos throughout the whole song. There's even songs like succubus that have, there's some one measure play too long, which I had to go in and kind of correct by kind of throwing an, a reverb echo voice thing that kind of comes backwards and then comes into the verse. Oh, to wow. kind of make up yeah. for that one extra measure. <laughs> yeah. So there's like oh, little shit. mistakes all over the place. I could talk all day what happened I'm from beyond because it was such a, and the thing is they took two weeks to do it, but only gave me two days to record at the end. I, I was there the whole time. And then they were like the last two days, they're like, okay, Cam, now it's your turn. You got to do it in two days. I like everybody else took all their sweet time. Billy went in and did it. Rick took as much time. He took almost like, I think eight days to record his guitars. And then the other guitar players came in doing solos. And then Terry took another four days and I get two days, two days just record it. But it's fine. That actually gave me kind of an incentive to how I record now is I like to try to record everything like it's live. I let the song go from the top. I don't, a lot of singers now I've watched, I've been in the studio many years and I've watched us singers. A lot of them vocalists will, piece everything together they'll do one line stop do the next line yeah stop that's common yeah. do the next line stop and i try not to do that i try to sound as natural as possible and do as much as i can live in one take i'm not saying i'm a one take master because i'm not there's sometimes i get out of breath and i have to go back and fix stuff but i do try to record it as much as natural as possible intentions everything on that front gosh there's so many things that you said in there I know. So, <laughs> I just, I, oh man! That's I why I said there's anything. a lot for the book. There's a lot for the book. I mean, if I yeah. ever get a. But well, why? Why weren't you asked by Eric and the director? I think it's Philippe uh, Belakazar. You know, Death by Metal, because your your voice was notably absent from that. Were you asked to be a part of that? Eric documentary? hates me. No, no. I, they never asked me. They never asked me to be in that documentary or anything. And Eric hates me for some reason. I've never met the guy in my life, but he hates me. But he needs me to be the villain. He needs me to be the Joker. He needs that. He needs that. You know, he needs to be the, I guess, the, the, the Commissioner Gordon behind the Chuck's Batman. So I'm 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 the villain. So he needs he needs me to be vilified so he can justify, you know, his things for whatever. Like I said, I've never met the guy ever in, in real life. I've never met him. I never sat in the same room with him or even talked to him like this over. The, he just loves to hate me for some reason. Um he just has this, he's just one of those guys that he, out of the blue, he picked it. Maybe he's a racist. I don't know. I have no idea. I have no clue. I have no idea. He, he just, he loves to hate me. And no, they never asked me. They never approached me. And then when some people did ask them about it, they said, oh, well, it wasn't about Camley. It was about Chuck. Well, yeah, I get it. But the documentary is not called Chuck. You know, the documentary is yeah, called exactly. Death. It's dead. Death yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And What's even funny is this, the death by metal is my handwriting. That's my handwriting. They used that's my handwriting. Oh, that's nuts. I'm looking at it now. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Holy shit. 
That's I would crazy, love to get a yeah. handwriting expert to sit down and just say, oh, yeah, that's his handwriting. And, and yeah, yeah. I love how they yeah. Eric doesn't even like he tries to, to hide the fact that I drew the death logo. I'm the one that drew the death logo. They try to say Chuck drew it. No, Chuck traced the death logo. He didn't draw it. He traced what I drew and he took some things out. My original debt logo has 666 around the inverted cross, which is the T. I think I've seen that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's the original debt logo. Chuck changed that. He took the 666 out because Chuck, I don't know, Chuck and Rick, well, Rick is a Christian. So, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm atheist. So it doesn't, you know, I, the whole thing is kind of hokey to me, religion altogether. But um, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, yeah, they, they try to take that away. They said, oh, well, no, Chuck created it. He'll still to this day, he'll fight it. Oh, no, Chuck drew it. Uh, okay, sure. Chuck never drew a damn thing in his entire life, but he comes up with, the you know, one of the most recognizable logos ever. And here I am, an artist that's drawn all my life and have stuff out there, not only logos, album covers and everything else. Mm. A couple of covers back here, actually, yeah, sweet. on the wall that I've drawn um, and done artwork for. So I don't know. And it's lovely how this lie just keeps permeating. I don't know. Maybe one finally Eric dies and I can finally say all the truth without being threatened, being sued. I can uh, finally, I don't know. Were you and Chuck mates, would you say? At first, yeah. Believe it or not. And I told Je John McAtee this because John McAtee wanted to know one time. He's like, hey, what happened, man? What happened between you guys? I said, well, first off, we were 16. We we're both 16. And I was living with Chuck. I actually lived with him for a while. And uh, this is after Rick was actually kicked out and uh, Chuck and I still stayed together as death. There's actually a video out on YouTube, very far away back in the, it's all squiggly and everything, but it's me on the drums and Chuck, Chuck and I just together, we played a show. We opened for a band called battalion of saints, a uh, punk band. And they, they recorded that show. And um, that's the only show that ever footage of me in the band um, playing and you can't see me because it's so far away, but uh, it's definitely me. And what had happened was, I think, um, well, what really happened was Chuck and I had an argument first off. And I make jokes about this all the time. But the day when I was living with him, uh, I woke up one morning before him. This is so funny. It's almost childish when you think about it. It's, but I ha it's such a funny story. I go out and his mom offers me, hey, would you like some breakfast? I'm like, sure. His mom was always nice. His mom was a real sweet lady. She is a sweet lady. She was really nice. And she she offered me Apple Jacks and she poured me the whole bowl of Apple Jacks and I'm sitting there eating. Well, Chuck woke, wakes up a couple of minutes later and he comes out and he wants some Apple Jacks and he flips out. He's like, where's the Apple Jacks? And his mom's like, well, Cam's eating it. And he totally flipped out that I was eating the last bowl of Apple Jacks. He kicked me out of the house. He kicked oh, me out of the house. Because I was eating the last bowl of Apple Jacks. I still stayed in the band. I said, fine, I'll leave. I'm sorry. I ate your Apple Jacks, man. Uh, <laughs> and I left. And I was still in the band for another week or so. And um, I, I was teasing him one, one day. And this happened right in front of Scott Oliva and Scott, oh, Scott Carlson and Matt Oliva. They were mm -hmm. down from Repulsion. They were actually down. They were actually at one point going to join death. Um, they were in a band, uh, I think, before Repulsion called Genocide. So they were down visiting. And this happened in front of them. I, I'm sure they can recall this happening. There was a girl that liked Chuck. And I was kind of goading Chuck. I was like, hey, man, why aren't you? You know, we're 16. So I was being a typical 16-year-old male. Um, and she, she was very well endowed. And, and I was teasing <laughs> them about it. I was like, hey, man, you know, why aren't you going for that? She's got big titties, man. Why aren't you going? And he was like, no, you know, he's curling his hair. No, no, I don't want to. And I, I was like, well, shit, man, if you don't want to do it, I'll fuck those titties. That was the last straw. He freaked out on me. He said, I don't want you here anymore. Get out of my band. I, and that was it. He kicked me out of the band for poor girl. That's literally what happened. Cause I, I mean, I was being, yeah, I admit I was being kind of, you know, you're being a, a young fella. You're being a young Yeah, I was being a misogynistic. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. doing it, but I didn't expect him to kick me out of the band because of that. I really didn't. But he literally kicked me out of them. I think he still was holding some resentment about the Apple Jacks, but um, oh, <laughs> I, I, I really think that's, oh, really? I mean, yeah, I think it was a little bit of a residual Apple Jacks hatred going on there that just kind of like fall, fall down into the, 
I'm a sarcastic smart ass. If you haven't figured that out yet, I, I, I've been this way all my life, but it's just a joke. Um, but some people don't know how to take it because I can be deadpan sometimes. And I think that's what really gets people. But it, I really do. I think that, that, that there was just some some kind of sarcastic, like me being sarcastic that just pushed him to the mm. edge. And he was like, that was it. That was I. You ate my Apple Jacks and now you're talking about this girl's titties that you want to have. Ah, that's it. And that was it. But I mean, we were 16. I mean, I, I people ask me, what do you what do you about Chuck? And I'm like, look, I don't know Chuck as a man. I knew Chuck as a teenager. Mm. I knew Chuck as a teenager who was a kind of a spoiled teenager. Um, I don't know. I didn't know Chuck later in life as a man. I meant I did talk to him a couple times before. he. I, I didn't even know he was sick. There was one time I talked to him um, after years, many years. And I, I saw him again with with. Uh, um, Richard Christie at one time I saw him in mm-hmm. Richard Christie. So nice. awesome. and yeah. I didn't, at the, I didn't even know Chuck was sick. I had no idea. And it was like maybe a, two months later he died, you know, after that. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. It all happened. Well, I mean, how would someone like myself know? It all seemed to happen fairly quickly, but I think his illness was only a two or three year long. Um, yeah. And he had it for about two or three years because there were some complications with insurance, I think. So he couldn't get, I mean, I don't know. I'm simply just what I've read yeah. and all the rest of it, but couldn't and that's, get see, that's the thing of, too. I mean, I don't want to be cruel. I'm not trying to be cruel. This isn't me being cruel, but it's, it, and this goes back to the whole death pop, popularity thing. Mm. Had, had Chuck had death been as popular prior to his death as it became, he would have been able to afford exactly the, the, yeah. the surgery. I mean, it's, that's the that's the, the the awful shame of it, man. It's just like, I mean, death was literally before, while he was still alive. He was actually to the point. Personally, I think he was to the point that he didn't want to do death anymore. He was already in control, denied. Death was kind of like put on the back table. He was kind of working, trying to do more, more uh, get away from death metal, I guess mm. you could say. And try to yeah, do definitely. Thing. Yeah. To me, I mean, to me, and it's a, again, personal opinion. The only death metal album that death has is Scream Bloody Gore. I mean, everything else after that okay. is, is changed. I don't I really consider. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't consider leprosy death metal. Uh, it has death metal elements, but and then, of course, spiritual healing. And then after spiritual healing, it just kind of like it it, it, it. It's no longer death metal. Um, I mean, that's just a personal opinion. Uh, to me, a death metal has to have some kind of. Um, edge to it and a simplicity that's kind of uh you know i don't know i don't want to categorize things i hate that too so it's kind of weird no i understand i mean look you're one of the founders of the genre you can say your your opinion holds weight and it's important to be honest and um i see your your perspective because his guitar playing was was never really a death metal style guitar playing was it's always Mm -hmm. extremely dynamic and it was heavily influenced by merciful fate king diamond iron maiden judas priest it was more in that vein it's his guitar playing really didn't change that much overall right the way from the early mantis demos to what he was doing uh with control denied in terms of style of course his technical expertise went off the map the, the older and more experienced he got but in terms of his approach and his style but I want to talk about another guitarist for a sec, and that's Alan West. So okay. I, I don't know whether he's out of prison yet or not, because um, that's certainly the last thing that I read about him was many years ago that he was in prison for something. But um, if he's out, was is there an inclination for you to reconnect with him? Because I know he appeared on the Aggressive Tyrant, or certainly he was credited as appearing on the Aggressive yes. Tyrant demo. Yes. He, he does. He does appear on. That's him. That's his guitar mm-hmm. playing on Aggressive Tyrant demo. Um, I did talk to Alan actually when he first got out of prison mm-hmm. uh when before uh i'm trying to remember the band he did he was already out of six foot under and he did something south something i can't remember the quite remember the name of the band yeah, not sure yeah yeah he did another band and i was in contact with him then and we had actually discussed putting the band together um and uh um nice it was really yeah the, we were discussing of doing something together and then he did something and went back to prison. <laughs> it was like, yeah. ah, man, Alan, damn it. But uh, yeah, yeah. So um, after that, I was like, I, I, you know, and it has nothing to do with him personally. It's just like, how can I rely on a guy that if he's going to keep, you know, messing up and ending back in jail, it's not like somebody that I want to, because I have to look at it this way. And, and I think that's what also irks a lot of people is, 
when I said I was going to get back in Massacre and now that I own the name, it's a trademark. Hmm. It's a business to me. It is. It's my business. It's not only just a band, but it's a business. And I have to look at it in two ways. I have to look at it as a band and have fun, of course, but I also have to look at it as a business. And as a business owner, am I going to go with the guy that is drunk or high all the time? Or am I going to go with the reliable guy that I've been working with for 15 years that I know can do the work and pull through regardless of where he's at and if he's going to go on tour, yeah, uh, just rogue with so. Johansson. Yeah. But I, and I had to look at the things this way, and especially with the resurgence album, um, how I had to look at that was uh, I had to look at the album first. That was most important. It's like, I've got to make my point and how I'm going to make my point is that a, a live show is a live show. Uh, I personally don't like playing live, but um, a live show is a live show. It, they come and go. Uh, you could go and say, Hey, yeah, I went to this live show, you know, in 19, you know, 85, I remember seeing, you know, Celtic Frost for the first time. That's personal to you. But that's not personal to everybody else. What's personal to everybody else is something like morbid tales. People that are Celtic Frost fans will remember morbid tales always yeah. as the Celtic Frost album. So to me, a show isn't as important as an album because a show is just that day, that time period when somebody can come and see you, the album, what's what's going to last forever. It's going to, what's going to continue after you're dead and gone. So my thought was, it's important that I get an album done the proper way, the right way. It doesn't matter at the time if the band members stay or go, or if they're just, you know, if they come in their session guys for just that album, I have to make the right album. I have to make the right album, regardless of whoever is going to stay or go. The core band is going to be me and Mike Waters right now. I mean, yeah. that's literally the core. Um, there could be different musicians that come in. Johnny has really been detrimental to the band as far as like not only being a guitar player, not only being partially, he wrote 50% of the album along with Roga, but he's also been a engineer and he's a fantastic engineer and has his own studio. So he's been really detrimental to the band. So uh, detrimental he's, as in he, he's he's caused problems you mean or he's oh, no he's no, actually, no i mean i mean not, i'm not i'm using the word wrong sorry okay, I get what saying. i mean he's, he's he's enhanced the band and given you a lot of quality he's essential and essential is what i was trying yeah. to say yeah, essential gotcha. I, yeah. I don't know why i was saying detrimental but the fact <laughs> it's so good I don't, damn english uh, uh yeah he was um he's essential to the band he's essential mm. as fact as far as he's more than just the guitar player he's he's also uh, an engineer and he's been the, he was the engineer on this album that helped okay. put it all together and then get everything set to Dan Sueno, who, who of course mixed it the man uh, and mastered it. Yes. Yeah. You, look, there's a, and, and the other fella, I want, I'd love to talk about Dan and also Scotty Fairfax from yes, Memoriam. Stop. Yes. Holy shit. Have, you've obviously heard the Memoriam albums. He is writing. Oh yes. Uh, I have, I have them all. <laughs> well, yeah. I, you know, I've spoken to King Carl about this stuff, but um you know, Scotty's riffage is just all time. How on earth he isn't right. on the front cover of whatever the heavy metal online version of Guitar World is? I don't know. He's just know. An, an amazing fucking guitarist. And he's, he's in. He's was part, actually, is he part of the band oh, now? I, well, it was actually a, it was it was a surprise because when I put this band together, I talked to Roga first. He was the first guitar player approached. And then hmm. I, t I talked to Johnny couple hours after contacting Roga and uh, um, Roga and Johnny both are, um, they don't like to play solos. They don't like to play leads. Um, they, they're great at writing riffs and write, great at structuring songs together, but they're not the, they're not the most, I guess uh, they don't feel comfortable writing leads. I don't personally like solos at all. <laughs> I'm, that's a personal opinion, but I'm an old punker. So I don't mm. care about solos, but I understand it's part of metal. And then Kind of like in a conversation with Mike Borders, Mike was just like, well, what about Scott? And I was like, Scott Fairfax? He's like, yeah, because I had just got done recording um, with uh, Scott's other band, As the World Burns, or okay. As the World Dies. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I said, um, yeah, I said, do you think he'll do it? I asked, well, this was me with Mike Borders back and forth talking on the phone. He's like, we can just ask. He can only just say no. I was like, oh, OK. Well, we asked him like together we were uh, on Facebook and a Facebook message together and we asked him and he was like, yes. And we were like, really? 
I was surprised. I was like thinking he was going to say, no, <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to do it. And he's like, yes, of course, anything you need, I'll help. I'm, I'm here to help. So um, even though he was a last kind of like, uh, he wasn't the last um, musician to ask, but he was the kind of like a, a added on thing. I was very surprised and very happy because Scott brought with him a different level. Cause I mean, everyone asked this question to me when they were first writing. Like I remember Rogo saying, do you want me to write it like massacre or do you want me to like, what do you want me to do? I was like, I want you to write it like you. Um, I want you to of course, listen to massacre. And he's like, and this was never a problem because they're all massacre fans, Rogo, mm. uh, Johnny, Scott, they're all massacre fans. So it was never really a problem of trying to get them to learn how to play Massacre. But I remember Scott asking me, do you want me to play solos like Rick? I'm like, no, I want you to play solos like you would. So I think that when I gave everyone that freedom to like freedom of expression to do whatever they wanted, but also I said, you know, keep it in the keep it in, you know, the parameters of Massacre, you know, keep it in, in there. But like I told Johnny and Roga, you guys are Swedish. I love Swedish death metal. I love mm. Roga sound. I love all the old school. There's something about Swedish death metal that's a little bit different. I said, let's use that. Pull that in. Don't feel like you have to just write like you're trying to write like a Florida death metal band. I said, you know, use those, stay within those parameters, but also feel it, feel free to kind of go outside the box. And I think they did an excellent job at doing that. I think they did really great at, at making it sound old school Florida death metal, but has a little Swedish kind of flair to it. And Scott was the same way. Scott said, do you want to play like Rick? I said, I want you to play like Scott. <laughs> I said, I want you to play like you. Hmm. And he added things in it that was blew me away, especially like the song Ruins of Arlay, the ending solo. That wasn't actually in there at first. And Scott put that in there. And I was like, oh, well, that's too cool. I've got to go back and put some vocals now. It literally made me want to like everybody yeah, worked so well song. together. Such yeah, we worked song. well off of each other. When Scott did that solo at the end, there was no vocals at the end of that song. And then when he put that solo in and I heard it, I was I, I told Johnny right away because he was the engineer. I said, you've got to let me record. I said, wait, wait, don't send that song off yet to, to Dan. Let me finish something. I've got that gave me an inspiration to write the last part of it. That's the the ending part. And there was a lot of that going back and forth when 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 uh, we would write stuff back and forth to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to let you know, there's there's material that hasn't that's not on the album. There's four songs nice. that didn't appear on the album that uh, we kept for an EP. Mm -hmm. And I think these four songs are better than the stuff on the album, <laughs> to be honest wow. with you. Um, and Scott just did amazing on those songs. And I, I almost felt like after I put the album together, I was like, why didn't we put one of these songs on the album? Because the solos on this are blazing. And I said, like, okay, it'll make it cool for the EP. It'll make it like Haunting the Chapel was when, when Slayer mm. first came out. Because everyone's like, Show No Mercy was great. But then when Haunting the Chapel came out before Hello Waits, and you heard that EP, it was like, whoa, this is like a next level. I mean, Show No Mercy was here, but when Haunting the Chapel came out, it was up here. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck? It's like a completely different... I really think that this this EP we have, the songs on this EP is, I kind of compare it to Haunting the Chapel. It's our Haunting the Chapel, if you can almost say. Mm. It compared to, compared to Re Resurgence, it, it's that far step. It's a fuck, you know, good yeah, jump. Yeah, it's a big step, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a, so Dan Swano, I wanted, there's a couple more people I want to talk about. Um, okay. So uh, I'll get to Marcus and Nuclear Blast soon, but I really want to okay. talk to you about your relationship with Dan, Dan Swano, because I think there's only two people that could have helped you deliver this album and it sounds as gnarly as it truly has. The first one is Dan, but the second one's Peter Tagtron. I just finished having a conversation with him this week. But they both come from the same school, both Swedish, and I know mm -hmm. I would never call Peter protege of Dan Swano, but it's a very similar approach and it, therefore execution they get extreme metal they just get yes. it both of those guys yeah. so so i don't think you could have picked anybody better than dan but how did the introduction to the fella come about yeah this is actually really really funny first off roga knows him really well uh because mm -hmm. of roga being in, in edge of sanity as well taking over um when dan left so uh i've known dan kind of for years but what really happened was we had a show in Germany because he's now in Germany. Um, 
He now mm-hmm. like lives in Germany rather than Sweden. And uh, we had a show, which is when we had a couple other, you know, guys in the band. Uh, I don't even want to talk about them. But <laughs> and we went over after this is after, you know, Rick, Rick quit and we had to replace them. So we replaced them with a couple of uh, local nitwits. Uh, they came in and we went over to finish these shows and we had this we had shows in Germany. It was the first shows and our very first show um, where, you know, you you're there at the gig, you're setting up and there's people out in the crowd and uh, the promoter comes up to me, and goes, hey, Dan Swendell's out in the crowd. I was like, oh, he is. I said, let's go. Let me go. Let me go meet him. So I went out in the crowd and I, I, I finally found him. You know, you can't miss him. He's taller than everybody else. And then I was like, hey, Dan, um, you know, and we, we talked and we met. He's like, I'm really looking forward to the show. I'm a kind of person where as I've gotten older, I just become bolder. I guess that happens when you get to, to my age. And I just started walking away from him and I turned back around real quick. I said, hey, Dan, by the way, you want to produce our album? And he was like, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> and it was just like that. It was just, I just asked him straight out. Nice. And, and that's how I've been doing stuff lately in my life. I just, cause I figured no, doesn't hurt me. No, doesn't. You can say no all day. It's not like a bullet it doesn't hurt. If you say no, I'm like, okay, cool. No problem. So I was like, now I get that way. I'm, I'm I wish I had this balls when I was younger, to be <laughs> honest with you. I wish I had this boldness, but I've gotten to the point where I'm just, so I'll just, I'll just ask. And I literally just went up to him while I was walking away from my turn back around and said, Hey, you want to produce a new Masker album? And he was like, sure, let's do this. I'm like, okay, you're it then. That's that's what we're going to use. And it was as simple as that. It literally happened that way. That was just like that. And so you went through, did, did the arrangement with Nuclear Blast come before the the negotiation, you know, the proper negotiations? Well, I was talking, I had been talking, I was talking to Nuclear Blast, but I wasn't one of those guys where I was like, oh, it's Nuclear Blast, I'm going to sign right away. Hmm. Um Honestly, to be honest with you, I actually thought Nuclear Blast was too big. And I was like, they're really? not going to get. Not. Yeah, I really I, I honestly I, I when I first w- was approached by them, I was like, ah, I don't want to sign with Nuclear Blast. And people were like, what? I'm like, yeah, they're not going to get me. I, I'm underground. I'm not a rock star. I, I, I don't I don't want to be a rock star. They, 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 they deal with rock stars. I, I said, I'm underground. I, I, I'm going to remain on. I, I need a smaller label. I literally was looking for a, for a smaller label because I felt that a smaller label was going to be able to understand what we were tra- what I'm trying to convey as massacre as an underground band. And I really felt that nuclear blast was too big. And I, 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 I was reluctant at first. And then talking who I ended up talking to was Geraldo. Uh, who's the guy over here? Yeah. Um, but now he's like the the whole. He's now takes he took over everything. But that's who I was talking to first, and we were just talking through Facebook and email. I think it was Facebook at first. Um, and uh, he was really laid back. He's a really cool guy. And then um, just talking to him, we were talking not on the level of like a, a record label trying to sign somebody. We were talking just on a level of just two guys talking. And I started to find out he had a lot of the same interests that I do and a lot of things outside of metal, um, like the geeky comic book stuff and collecting toys and stuff like that. So we were hitting it off on that kind of way. And then um, then he started talking to me. He's like, you know, man, I grew up listening to From Beyond. And, you know, I, I this is the this is the band that got me into this and I love it. And, uh, you know, so it literally was after months of talking back and forth to people uh, and talking to him at Nuclear Blast that I finally said, well, maybe they will get me. Maybe they will understand what I'm trying to do. And they've been great ever since. I mean, I really, I honestly thought that Nuclear Blast was like, ah, they're too high. They're too low. It's, they're not going to get underground. They're not going to, they're too, they're, they're on that, they're on that Rob Zombie level. You know, they're, yeah. they got bands like yeah, Rob Zombie. They're not going to get Slayer. some, yeah, they're not going to get some underground, you know, dweeb still living, <laughs> you know, like, you know, living in an underground. I don't think of rocks. I hate that rock star attitude. So I, I don't even, even, even with some of the death metal bands that like live like rock stars. I hate that. That's why I don't get along with a lot of them. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. You know, I'm just the average guy that just, I'm just doing music just for fun. You know, I'm not looking at it for like, uh, it's, I don't rely on it for as a career, but I do take it serious. Hmm. Like I said, because, you know, I put, I invested in it. So and like, if you invested in anything, you're going to take it serious because it's, you put, 
you know, money into it. You put yourself into it. But I don't look at it as like, I don't look at it as like, hey, I'm a rock star and you need to recognize me. And, you know, like a lot of people in Tampa that I won't mention <laughs> their names. But yeah. Do you know, uh, do you know Trey at all from Morbid Angel? If you're living in yes, Tampa, I do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, had a, yeah I, I, had a, I do. I had a chat with his mother a couple of years ago for the podcast. Lovely lady. And um, he's uh, he seems to be one of those guys that's just a little bit beyond everybody's reach as a journalist in terms of being able to lock him down mm-hmm. for a conversation like what we're doing here and now. And and I don't think I'm saying anything untoward here and saying I don't think he can do these sorts of things. But but I'd, I'd love to see you and him do something. You know, I've always love- wanted to do something. Yeah. yeah I've always wanted to do something making- with Trey. I, I mean, I remember back before, before – more all this back going back to 1986. I used to go to Trey's house um, when, with his parents, you know, when he lived, he lived with his parents. I used to go to his house and hang out in his room. Actually, Trey was the first person to show me how to start playing guitar. Literally. What a teacher. I, I was in yeah. bands with Rick and those, those guys didn't show me how to play. Trey was the first person to show me power chords and I would sit in his room and play power chords and he would t- teach me. how. I do. You know what I think? He taught me how to play a possessed song and it was uh, I think it was The Exorcist from mm-hmm. Possessed. Trey taught me how to play that song on guitar. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've always gotten along with Trey. Trey's kind of like now, you know, he's not, like you said, he's on a different level um, now. Um, but, uh, yeah, it would have been great to work with, with him at, at one point. I would love to have done something. With, just uh, do some maniacal you. little experimental EP with your vocal, with yeah. his guitar yeah. playing, and no more extreme elements. If he's got it, saying Trey's already extreme, but taking it that couple of steps beyond, like he can, where it feels like it's just mm-hmm. loose and out of control. I'd love, yeah. I'd love that. And um, I often, I often think of drummers, and I know this one can't happen for obvious reasons. But Sean Ryan, it, you know, unfortunately yeah. passed away a couple of years ago. But um, having him drum in a band like that, I, I often do that, as I say, with uh, that matchmaking from some of mm-hmm. these, these greats, including yourself, getting you guys together. But it, it is such a, it is so refreshing to see you back. And and the other thing too is the enthusiasm for which you talk about the project, Massacre, these days. And and I had, I'm part of the Nuclear Blast uh, media stuff. So I, I had a, I've had a copy now. It must be, might even be a couple of months now. I don't know, but I've been listening to it a lot. Oh, thank and, you. And I know you've talked about this before in your Instagram stories, your reels there, that, um it does feel like a natural successor to From Beyond, and I think that there's there's clearly reasons why that why that is the case. But you know, the the leaning into the Lovecraftian themes with uh, I call it Ruins of Riley. I know it's not. I know you mentioned it was something Arle. I think you said it's a Ruins of Arle. Yeah. Probably my favourite cut on the album, The Innsmouth Strain. Like it. Uh, and the Eldritch Prophecy. All these are lyrical themes that sort of lean into that Lovecraftian thing. That, as I said, so. Is that is that where your head's at at the moment? Are you sort of riding, leaning into that 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 uh, Lovecraftian fantasy world, or is it is it is that just a couple of those songs that not in that direction? You've got other songs that go in a different direction. Actually, for this, I wanted to go back to that uh, Lovecraft. I guess you call it Lovecraft County country kind mm-hmm. of thing. I wanted to go back into that world, but I I, I live in Lovecraft world. <laughs> I mean, I I I even play like uh role playing tabletop games. Uh nice. a lot of them from Lovecraft like Arkham Horror, uh Elder Sign, uh Mansions of Madness. Uh me and my wife play a lot of these games uh on our weekends and uh so I kind of live in that kind of existence and world. and I just love the whole uh Lovecraft uh the feel of it and uh, like I was telling somebody earlier and and that didn't know anything about Lovecraft. I said, here's the thing about Lovecraft. It's, it's in his short stories, especially there's no happy endings. <laughs> there's, mm. they, they, uh, you never come out at the end, like you've defeated the horror that you've faced. You never come out. Most narrators at the end of a Lovecraft story, either go crazy or die. I mean, mm. that's it. I mean, they're, they're either dead at the, by the time you get to the end, they're dead or they've gone insane. So that's always been kind of a, uh, a cool. Now I use it in a way to express my misanthropy, um, to be honest with you. I mm. use it in a way to, to kind of like uh, metaphorically express uh, my own hatred towards mankind. <laughs> so uh, that's literally, I literally use Lovecraft in that sense um, when, when I write. But there, there's stuff about it. Like I'm not a person that takes direct, um, like a story and say, okay, I'm going to write based on this story and write the entire song like I don't do like remake reenact the story and make a movie 
uh, version out of it. I just take small snippets and ideas from it and titles like I did with uh, the um, like from beyond or the whisper in darkness, the whisper in darkness lyrically only has a little bit to do with the story. It doesn't have the overall uh, story in it. Cause like I, I remember somebody saying you didn't mention, you know, uh, Migus or, uh, you know, brains being put into a jar. I'm like, yeah, well that's all, that's the main part of the story. I said, I just used a small snippet of the story, which is um, I like the, the, the idea of like the whole unspeakable cults, like the cult, like you've seen the video. So I really like that, that whole, like uh, some kind of cult somewhere that's yeah. like worshiping this God, this unknown God. And they're kind of summoning this God or doing whatever they're doing. Um, and, and uh, that's one of the things I like the games for, because in the game, you always play sort of this investigator or lead investigator that you come across these horrors in the darkness. And usually there's a cult that's summoning these things that you have to kind of, you know, come across and kind of, they're like these antagonists that you have to fight to get to the main thing, to stop them from summoning the great old one coming into the world to take over and destroy all of mankind. So it's, it has that, it's kind of like a repeated sort of scenario that uh, always happens in Lovecraft, but that's literally, I think Lovecraft just looked at it as like, when he writes about the old ones and the ancient ones, they're so vast, they're beyond gods. They're like humans are just microscopic, entities in this great grass universe that we don't really matter but humans ourselves we think we're the center of the you know the universe like everything revolves around us and i love lovecraft's take on it that uh no we're nothing uh, these beings don't even look at us we're like you know not we're like microscopic organs on a petri plate to most of them they don't mm -hmm. like even acknowledge us on that level yet they'll destroy us if they find us it's almost like oh fuck a roach <laughs> oh shit you know humans ah oh, fuck it <laughs> kill that thing and i i so i say say i just use the the aspect of misanthropy that i have and mm. and kind of write that kind of way in my lyrics i mean there's a lot of hidden stuff in the lyrics like once you get the lyrics you'll you'll read it and and there's a lot of stuff throwbacks to from beyond which from beyond also is very misanthropic. If you actually read it, I mean, the, the lyrics. So it's a continuation of, of that. But uh, I don't try to like write something that somebody says, oh, it's deep. What he wrote was deep. It's, it's, it's life change. I mean, it's death metal. I'm not trying to like write the great opus of like, oh, he changed my life. He saved me. He wrote about suicide and it changed everything that I thought about it. No, that's not me. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to be that guy. <laughs> You know, I'm just writing about scary shit that's in the darkness that wants to squish your fucking head. <laughs> I mean, I literally. So, so with the Lovecraft themes, do you, do you read books by guys like Ramsey Campbell at all? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, Ramsey yeah. Campbell, uh, Brian Lumley, um, mm -hmm. who's one of who, one of my favorites. Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm trying, trying to remember some of them. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I go off the top of my head. Clark Ashton Smith. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm trying to remember who else. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't actually it's been heaps, reading any. Yeah, heaps of part of that that Lovecraft mythos that you know influenced yes. directly from Lovecraft. It's a bit like like you. There's heaps of bands that have sort of inspired by Massacre, you know. And mm -hmm. um, but what about uh, I, was, I was talking to uh, Stuart and uh, Nick Barker, Stuart Ansis and Nick Barker from Cradle okay, of yeah, Filth. Yeah. And they told me that before they parted company with the group, they were working on a Clyde Barker concept album. So that's one of the greatest albums we will never hear. With oh, those guys in that band. Oh, look, it's I get hit up all the time and say, hey, because apparently demos exist. So mm -hmm. the music was partially written because Stuart, if you know what was going right. on in that band, wrote Cruelty and the Beast alongside of the keyboard player yeah. Les and Nick Barker. But but for you, with with this um, with your understanding of the Lovecraft mythos, and I know a few people have tried it, but I actually think you do it justice. Could you see yourself doing specifically a dedicated Lovecraft concept album under the Mass Massacre name? Yeah, I mean, I could. I definitely could see something. Actually, I've been thinking that might be the next album in yeah. sort of a way. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny that you mentioned Nick Barker because, like, he was one person I considered getting in contact with to do drums. Uh, I was just I was like, I, I should ask Nick. And then it just kind of came across. Uh, actually, I, like I was saying, we, 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 we were kind of like at the end, and I was going to use a different drummer than, than Brian Jar. Uh, um, we had a drummer in the States that we were going to use. And then he, he pulled out the last minute 
because of, of, of medical reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to get into it, but yeah, it was medical reasons. And I was like, Oh shit, we have no drummer. And I was well, like, well, and Rogo was like, just, just get Brinjar to do it. And I'm like, okay. And that's what I'm going to do. Cause, um, but then I, one of the drummers I actually thought about contacting was Nick. I was like, man, I wonder if Nick would do it. That and, would have been uh, awesome, dude. That would have been I, fantastic. I know. Wow. I mean, yeah. I'm still open. I'm still open. Massacres. I mean, there's, there's, I've got, to me, I've got two more albums in me. I mean, I am, I'm going to be 55 here in, in Halloween. So um, it's, it's like, do I want to be doing this when I'm 60? I don't know. Should I be doing death metal when I'm 60? I don't know. Cam, you so need I, to do it. Keep doing it, please. I, yeah, I think I, this I is would, your home, musically speaking. I, I know. I mean, I, I just think about it. I'm like, does somebody wants to come see an old fucker doing death metal at, at, uh, on stage? But I mean, I mean, I see guys out there doing metal now, like, you know, still in their 70s. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. But I mean, I do concept wise. I have two more albums in me that I feel mm. I could really yep. do justice and do it the right way. Um, so already uh, Johnny started writing some new songs and and uh, we've been back and forth, sending stuff back and forth. And I've been the first set of stuff was like, ah, no, that's getting too far off, off in left field over here. Let's pull mm-hmm. it back in. Let's reel it back in. Start sounding more like Massacre. So we've got we've been working on on a new album uh, now and I've got some concepts and the, the concepts I have definitely are in that Lovecraft uh, a little bit more. Um, pulled in closer actually the the songs i was telling you about on the ep Mm. they're actually closer to lovecraft being directly influenced from actually two of them two songs directly one is called the dunwich horror and and it's based right off the song the story yeah and the other one is the the thing on the doorstep which is literally based off the story again i took a little thing out of the story which i thought was kind of interesting was in that particular story the thing on the doorstep there's a code that the two characters in the, in the story would knock, they would knock three times and twice. So they would know, cause they were sharing, a, they were going to college together and it was mm-hmm. kind of like, so they did this, this code of knocking three times and then two times more. And I liked the way that Lovecraft wrote that line, knock three times and two times more. And I was like, man, that is catchy as fuck. Yeah. I'm going to say that in a song. And I use that. Uh, so that's kind of like the pre-chorus, knock two, three times, two times more to let me know that you're at the door. So I was like, that's so that's directly from the story. It's I mean, the, those lyrics derive directly from the story. And so does the Dunwich Horror. They derive mm-hmm. directly from the story. Um, so those are the closest literally besides. Uh, yeah, those are the closest straight direct from um, Lovecraft stories I've ever written. They're mm-hmm. directly straight from the story. They're not just like me taking influence from it so and then uh the other song which is um i'm trying to remember the name of it (laughs) my own song i can't remember the name of it uh because it's changed names so many times actually um uh behind the uh shit behind the serpent curse i couldn't think of the name for a second behind the serpent's curse that's actually the one anders odin is on um that song is written about the there's a story that lovecraft wrote called the curse of yig which is yeah. about this the the god yig is the serpent god that story itself is actually based directly straight from that that story you know especially about the i don't know if you know the story but the when the wife thinks the husband is turning into the serpent and she hacks him up with the hatchet okay yeah i haven't read that one yeah. but i know i certainly know yeah, that all yeah. of the titles are familiar i think i've listened to them on an audio book but i think you gotta read mm-hmm. you gotta read love yeah, yeah exactly the same. yeah yeah well there, that that's the story where where there's this the, north american fake indian god called yig and it's a serpent god and then the the the, the husband is totally he's frightful he has that you know fear of serpents and uh he gets bit or you know, buy one and he gets mm-hmm. sick. And then the wife, we never know in the story, it's written so well. We never know if the wife is actually seeing him change or is this an illusion that's happening? And she ends up murdering him, hacks him up. But then she ends up in an insane asylum. And at the end, when the investigators come in to look at her, she's actually turning into a snake creature herself mm. at the end. So it's, yeah. Like I said, there's always never a happy ending with Lovecraft. There's always something. Yeah. But uh, that, so that, that song is based very heavily on, on that, that premise. 
Hey, the uh, former Cradle of Filth guitarist Paul Alenda now lives in the Midwest. And oh, okay. he's, he's got a band called The Unnamed Horror, so you'll pick up the reference straight away probably. Oh, yeah. But he's that. I don't, I don't think it's a concept album based on Lovecraft, but when I was talking to him, he was talking about how his, his deep appreciation is now morphing into being able to sort of in, uh, like blend it and, and mix it into some of the songwriting and the lyrics that he's doing these days. So there's. A, I'm just saying, I mean, you, you're not short of options. I get that. But, I mean, somebody else who's right into the Lovecraft thing is him, and he's a bloody good bloke too, by the way. Um, yeah, he's somebody, he was he was put through the fucking ringer with Cradle of Filth. Um, and it's oh yeah, I know his... a lot of those guys. I mean, I talked to Dave Pybus too, so it's like I know. Oh I really? Know what... Oh, you yeah. get it then? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm trying to help. Well, me those and Dave guys. actually. Yeah, sorry. Man. Yeah. I thought to say me and me and Dave Pybus actually talked about you know doing something together um, at one time, and we demoed a song uh, together, and it's it's pretty awesome, but it just never went anywhere. <laughs> After we demoed it, I was like, I was very surprised. It's very, it has a kind of, it's like if you can imagine Cradle Foot with me on vocals, I guess. Oh wow! It's, it's, it, okay. Yeah. 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 That'd be interesting. Yeah. I'm not, yeah I'd, yeah. I'd never envisioned that actually. Yeah. Paul, Paul's a yeah. very grinding guitarist that I think suits mm-hmm. his style. He's not a really bombastic yeah. guitarist. He's very direct, you know, mm-hmm. with his playing. Um, and he has that. He's, he's definitely an extreme metal guitarist is what I'm saying. He, he was. Yeah. Even I would he, love, yeah. Yeah. Even I would though he love wrote to, most you... of the music in Cradle of Filth, he's such a weird, he's such a weird match for that band. Ultimately, I think that's why I didn't last. Yeah. But sorry, you were saying, go for it. I was going to say, if, if you uh, ever can, you know, I don't have contact with people because I got off Facebook and I'm only on Instagram. But if you ever like want to like introduce, introduce us, you know, on Instagram, I'll message say, him. hey, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll just message say, him. hey, yeah. I was just talking to Cam the other day and he's like, he'd want to do something with you. Just something like that. I'm open. I'm totally open to do something like that. That's cool. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know he's a, he's a, he's a, I know, I know he, he, I'll, I'll let him tell you his cradle of filth story. Yeah. Okay, he's, he's asked me not okay, to share yeah. too much, but when you yeah, guys, connect, I understand. Yeah, oh, I get know, it. It's yeah, I get I'm, it. I, I, well, you do. Yeah, I know you get it. Yeah, I have the same. I mean, I have the same thing. I, I'm always like, even with you, I'm like, man, how much can I say? How much should I not say? Because uh, I, you know, so no, so much with Eric Grief and and Terry Butler and Rick Ross and even the two other fucking uh assholes that came or, oh wait uh two other gentlemen <laughs> that came from this band that did their own revenge band by calling it uh in human condition and going off and getting with uh terry right away after mm. they were in this band for less than six months but they felt entitled to be massacre uh i tell people the story all the time like what they were doing and it's like god well those guys had some balls didn't they i'm like yeah un- unbelievable but, uh, you know, I don't want to get into talking about bad stuff, but literally all it was was uh, the drummer who I guess plays in Venom Inc. felt that he was more superior and that. He oh, right. Knew, OK. Yeah. He knew yeah. what was better for Massacre and that he was going to come in and start telling me how the band should be run and how we should do this things in that way. And I basically just said, stop. No. And I sold the word. I put the word. Hey, I, I told him, no. And if he flipped out, I mean, literally flipped out on me. I then after that, I went and I watched a bunch of videos on narcissism on YouTube. And I found out that narcissists hate the word. No, that's actually one of the trigger words that if you tell a narcissist, no, that they will go off on you and they'll start gaslighting you and stuff like that. I was like, wow, that's exactly what happened to me. I told this guy no. And he flipped out. The first thing he said to me was, you've done it now, buddy. You've done it now. You it's all over now. I said, like, Oh, it's all over because I told you no. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah. 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 And yeah. then the next thing, yeah, the next day they go out and they they put on uh another black. I love people that use blabbermouth. If you notice, I don't use blabbermouth, but <laughs> everybody that ever uses blabbermouth no, loves to ri- ri- uh have an article about me. So the two- next day they went out and had an article about me on blabbermouth. It's amazing. Well, you've you've been I mean, it's funny. using Instagram, which is the right way to do it. You've been communicating directly to fans. Mm-hmm. I love too that you know. I know who runs Blabbermouth. I'm not dumb. It's Borovor. Mm-hmm. I've known Borovor for years. I've known that fucker for years. I know. I know what he's like. I remember when he took over for was it uh, Metal Maniacs? I remember. I remember. I remember him before. I knew when he was nothing. When he was going to college, him and Monty Connor, and they were running the little college radio station. You know. I know Borvor. I know how he's been all these years. I, you know, I have all the articles that he wrote about death and how he even left me out of stuff. And, and I know him. 
So, yeah, I, I know what I know what he's like. I know what he's about. That's exactly he's a smart ass. And that's exactly what Blabbermouth is. It's like an instigation site, the site to instigate and and start. I call it the like it's it's the tabloid of of the metal scene. It's it's the worst. It's like a rat tabloid rag. Like you go into the supermarket and it's the one that's up in the front with Bigfoot and mm-hmm. some some baby. You know, I had Bigfoot's baby. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's literally that kind of journalism. Yeah. It's a tough one because it's got 1.2 million Facebook followers. So therefore, yeah. it's got a shitload of metal fans eyes and and ears, depending on how mm-hmm. they're consuming it. I, I, a lot of my stuff, I'll let you know, gets picked up by Blabbermouth, and um, I can I can see the pros and the cons. So, one from one side of from one one side of the coin, you've got any publicity is good publicity. In other words, it's yes. raising it's just raising awareness. You're back out there, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. Cam is back. Massacre is his, and mm-hmm. this is an ongoing concern from from now. This and 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 that's Blabbermouth is a great forum for that. The other side of it is ask David Ellison. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, well, you know I, I, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, I actually had an interview with Jensen from uh, the Swedish magazine and he told me, he actually made me realize something. He's like, you know, you only know all this stuff because you're in it. You're around these people. They're personal, like, you know, the ex former members. I said, but he said, you know, the real fans don't care. Yes. The real fans don't true. care about all this gossip shit. They don't care. They only care that you're back and that it's it's proper massacre. And I was like really grateful that he said that. I was like, thank you. I mean, that's literally what all I care about. I don't care about the rumors and, and stuff like that. If people want to hate me, I don't really care. But what I really care is if people get it, that I really tried my best to bring a proper massacre album, like something I felt. You've that definitely needed. done that. I absolutely agree with you on that point there. And it needed to be done. And it's a fucking killer album from start to finish it is man you, you should be I'm, I'm glad you're happy with it and you should be very proud of it the albums are there for for posterity's sake you know nobody's mm-hmm. going to become a millionaire or even to be honest exactly. make a substantial living off playing death metal but fans we care so deeply that you are back out there doing what it is that you do and reclaiming what is rightfully yours and and thank you and when you stand within your own truth you produce an album like what you've done thank you I mean, I really, I really, that's, that means a lot to me uh, that you, you see that. It means a lot to me when people see that. Cause I know there's, I'm a really, I'm really bad at this. And I think the internet's bad for this mm. is I can read a whole column of good reviews. People saying, I'm glad Cam's back. This is awesome. This sounds like the proper massacre. This is amazing. And then I get that one asshole mm-hmm. that says something shitty. Oh, well, it's not real massacre because Rick Ross isn't in the band. And it just takes it takes all the other stuff and just goes. And I'm the person that I, my wife always tells me, you shouldn't even look at that shit. But <laughs> she's always like, stop looking at that, because that's what always puts you that you're elated. And then you get down to that one review and then you're bummed for the rest of the day. She's mm-hmm. like, stop looking at the Internet because she says that's that's the problem. And it does. It does. It, it I don't know why that one bad review will reflect and do that. It's just weird. I can read a, you know, hundred great reviews and that one bad review or that one shitty comment. And that's what they're there. They're, they're, they're trying to do that. I know they're, so I'm falling for exactly for the trap. I'm falling for the shit that they're trying to do. And I'm like, I need to stop doing that. I need to stop doing it. Cause I'll get, I'll, I'll get all depressed. I'll get fuck. And then my wife's mm-hmm. like, you can't please everybody. I'm like, yeah, I know. And, and then she's like, they're only saying that shit to get to you. And I'm like, yeah, I know. She's like, and you're letting it get to him. Like, yeah, I know. I don't know what it is. I'm letting it get to me. But yeah, it's 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 true. Yeah. That's how it happens. Look, I get it. I get it too, especially on the YouTube channel. Some people shit posts and stuff. And and sometimes I've got to say I agree with them, which is why I actually engage with them. You know, some people say I'm I, I'm very verbose on, in my conversations and I talk, you know, when I shouldn't be speaking, I should let other people talk. And I think, well, sometimes I get in the moment. I'm talking, hey, I'm talking to Cam yeah. Lee right now. From my <laughs> perspective, I mean, this is fucking cool. I mean, this is my inner sixteen-year-old. It's just, thank you. You know, you know what I mean. It's 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 important, yeah. man. It's it's very important. You know, there are young fellas like me. I went through a boarding school, you see, so my mm-hmm. outlet was heavy metal. And when I when I was listening to to massacre and and early death and all of this sort of stuff, it's a friend. It's a mm-hmm. friend. It's not just music. 
this is more than music. This is something that kept me company. You know, when, when I didn't have a lot of mates when I was a young fella, you know, a marginalized yeah. heavy metal fan in a fucking boarding school, you know, nobody gave a shit about metal except for me. So, so it, it is, I think, I think people get attached to things and then occasionally, and you're always going to get overwhelming support, I believe, because you're standing within your own truth, but then occasionally you're going to read things and they don't make a lot of sense. And I, I do it too, actually, I've got to say, um, or every, everything that I get sent to me, direct messages, and I'm sure this is the same for you, is over. Is just so great. I'm so grateful for the amount of support I get for the podcast. And no doubt, it's, as mm-hmm. I say, it's the same for you with metal, but you just read that one fucking comment. It's the one in 100. And it says, yes. it says you didn't ask this, you're a shit interviewer or whatever. And you go, oh, fuck, well, should I have asked that question? And you think, fuck yeah. it. What's, what's the point? I mean, you can't be all things to all people and one out of 100 ain't a bad strike rate. I know. I, I, I do. I, I, I think what happens is, like you said, when somebody does say something and it makes you reflect, like you just said, should have you have asked that question? I always ask the question, like, should I have tried harder to, you know, maybe work with Rick? And then but the thing is, people only know it from the point of view as, oh, this was Rick Ross and this was and they know Rick from death. So they they say, oh, it's the guy from leprosy. And, and even though he was only on leprosy, uh, he was in the band earlier. And and uh, um, and then I'm like, well, you guys not look at the rest of the stuff, you know, it's like uh, and then they say, oh, it's not real massacre because Rick's not in it. And I'm like, then I think, should I have tried harder to work with Rick? And then my wife's always, would you want to keep working with a guy that rips you off all the time? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I, I tried to work with him. I did try to work. It's not like I didn't try to work. With him. The fans don't know that. Or the one fan that's kind of being a smart yeah. ass doesn't know that. But I really did. We did try to work with him. We did. The thing is, we didn't get into a heated out argument like with Chuck, where Chuck kicked me out of the house for Apple Jacks. It wasn't even like that. It was just like it literally was just like Rick was just like, well, fine, I'm just out. I quit. It was a, one sentence. I quit. And I'm taking the drummer with me. OK. But the way that Mike Borders put it was like, he wanted to crash and burn it. He was telling fans prior to him quitting that he was going to do this. He was going to quit. And he really literally thought that if he wasn't in the band, it wasn't going to keep continue to keep going. Mm-hmm. So he's his, the, his mind was, I'm going to crash and burn this. I'm going to get out and it's going to fail. Um, and it was really kind of shitty because he knew I had invested all the money, my own money into getting the trademark. And it was thousands of dollars. It wasn't like, you know, oh, it was only a couple hundred bucks. It's thousands of dollars yeah. of my it's own money. It's an investment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, it's like he almost like did it to be kind of a, like just to, to, uh, to scorn me like, Hey, fuck you, man. I know you spent thousands of dollars to get the name, but you know what? It's going to fail anyway. So it was almost like that was how his attitude was. And it was I don't know. I don't know. I don't get the guy. I still don't get the guy after all these years. I don't understand it. I don't understand why massacre doesn't work. People is maybe there's a massacre curse. I don't believe in curses. I'm, I don't know, but maybe there really is something. I don't know. I've got a theory and I'll share it with you. I think bands should never be democracies. Okay. Yeah. They should be benevolent dictatorships. And I I know I do believe this is why cradle of filth as an entity, I'm not talking about musically has been so successful because Danny has controlled that band with an iron fist. I suppose he has to, because he's had, he's had almost 30 tenured band members come and go since like from principle of evil made flesh up to now, there's been 28, Mm -hmm. I think, if I'm not mistaken, someone correct me, but 28 band members come and go, not including the people I think in the band at the moment. So over 30 people have come and gone. I think for bands, especially extreme metal bands, where you're talking about their very skinny margins financially. So you've Mm -hmm. got to be in it because you love it, okay? I think for it to be a success, you need to be the fellow controlling almost every aspect of everything, then it clicks. If you delegate and you leave it to people, whether it's Rick or whether it's Terry or whoever it might be, Billy, all of these guys that have had a role, because that's what Mm -hmm. it is ultimately. You're the face of the band, Make no mistake, I'm a bassist and I'm sorry, I do sing too, but the singer is the guy or the girl. You know what I'm saying? That's who you most right, immediately yeah. identify the band with. Until you were ready to step up and do the things that you've done, which you've clearly had to do, and now it's happened, now mm-hmm. the massacre story can continue. Otherwise, up until now, mate, it was, and if, I hope, forgive me for using this word, but it's a pantomime. You know, there's just yeah, shit going on left, right and centre. But now that you're in the driver's chair, you've got your hand on the steering wheel. You know, it's your band, brother. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that from you. And and that's literally how I've had to kind of like think of it 
and say, okay, I let all these other guys drive or steer the car or, you know, however you want to, whatever mm -hmm. metaphor you want to use. So they were, they were, they were in the driver's seat. They played the chief. Um, and uh, it's my turn. It's my turn to, to show what I can do and, properly. I, I, I can't, I'll just keep going back to that word proper. I just, it's, it's my turn to show fans what it should have been the whole time rather than, and, and, and uh, cause other people did, have the driver's seat and they totally it when when they took control it was like okay death metal and then okay cam left and then somebody else took control and it went way over here or this way left field and it's like massacre went into left field on the promise album which i i walked out of the studio and that i was like what the mm. fuck am i doing here i quit while it was still in the studio i i said this isn't death metal this is shit i didn't even think the album was going to come out it took them two more years to release it then it came out and then the band went through so many different things. And then I came back into it in 2007, which that's a story in itself too, <laughs> for the book, um, only because it was like a con. It was like, it was a whole joke. It was a Terry Butler kind of like, well, we can go out on tour, but only if, if it's Massacre. Oh, okay. Well, I had a band at the time, Denial Fiend. And it was like, Denial Fiend, no one was going to pick up. Oh, we can get you on tour. Terry gets in the band and all of a sudden it turns into, we'll get the band on tour. But while it was on tour, all they cared about was Massacre. They didn't care about the Nile Fiend. It was like, okay, I'm out here trying to push my new band, but everybody, including the band members in, in the Nile Fiend, other than Curtis, was like trying to be Massacre. And it's like, I, this isn't what I wanted. It's not what I signed on for. Uh, and I finally just said, I had to put a stop to it. After we played the Vodka Fest in 2008, I said, that's it. It's done. If you want to continue as Massacre, go find Rick. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> he did. He did. It took him two years. But so from him, 2010 to 2014, they did their version of Massacre. And it still failed. And I don't know. It still failed. It didn't it didn't survive. Yeah. It, it and, you know, it, it, they did their version and they were I mean, they even had an article in Kerrang magazine that my wife always gets upset and remembers mm -hmm. that the article, the heading of the article literally was so something to the point of uh cam lee is a hard person to work with i mean that was like bigger than the actual name of the band and who the the thing was it was like my name was a big wide thing and i remember my wife got really upset about that she 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 was like that's you should sue kerrang i'm like fuck it at least my name's bolder and bigger than the massacre name that's how i looked at it right <laughs> my name's bigger it's up there bigger than the band name you know i don't care what they say but uh that I guess the quest, what it was, it was a, it was a, it was a quote from a question that they asked why they didn't get back in touch with me. Why, why I had another singer and their, uh, Terry's answer was, I was a hard person to work with. And I always tell people this, no, I wasn't that I'm a hard person to work with anybody that meets me literally can see I'm easy to talk to. I'm a hard person to manipulate. Yeah. And that's what that, that's what it was. They mm -hmm. wanted to manipulate me. And then they couldn't manipulate me anymore. Oh, he's hard to work with. That's how it changes. It's a little change of wording. Oh, yeah, you're, I'm hard. I'm not hard to work with. I'm hard to work against. And that's 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 the problem. So, uh, yeah, you know, and that's yeah. yeah, that's how I look at it. That's how their their motive has always been. It's very hard. It's hard because the people I always wonder, I look back and go, man, why didn't it? Why hasn't it worked? How come everybody else can make it work? But this band couldn't make it work. And like I said, I went on YouTube and I looked up a lot of stuff on narcissism and I realized, wow, I was in a band full of narcissists. Of course it didn't work. I'm in a band with not one, not two, but a bunch of narcissists that kept gaslighting each other. And then they constantly do it. They blame each other for it. I'm not going to blame specifically Rick Ross. I'm not going to blame specifically Terry Butler. They'll blame me, but... I think it was just a combination of everything, everybody having their own personal agendas and not really thinking about the band. Hmm. And to me, it really needs to be about the band because that's what it is. It's a business about the band. If you want to be Rick Ross, then go and make Rick Ross's band. You want to be Terry. Well, Terry's doing that again. Anyways, he's got his own band with yeah, he's out on the road. The money. Money. Yeah. 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 So he's got all kinds of stuff going on. So I don't know. I, I I don't understand it. I just know that those those people are no longer a part of Massacre. 
they're the part of past and the future is brighter because I feel that once this album is out and it's going to be out in less than two weeks <laughs> mm-hmm. and then I people give it a chance. Like you've saw, you, you've, you've said yourself and I've heard other good reviews about it. If people really give it a chance without being judgmental about me, don't, I don't care that people think about me. I don't want you to think uh, it's a Cam Lee thing or something like that. I don't look at it, listen to it from a point of view as a fan of death metal. You know, I, I almost wish that I didn't have all the, the back stuff going into it. I, I wish that people would just look at it as like, wow, this is a cool death metal album, you know, accept it for well, what think, it is. I think Massacre was an extremely, it was always one of those bands when I was growing up, you're <laughs> like, wow, that band should have been heaps bigger than what it was because From Beyond is a classic death metal album. There's no two ways about it. I know, I understand it's it got its flaws, but Ultimately, it's one of the most important death metal albums from that era, no doubt, especially from a Flor- Floridian perspective, which was the epicenter of, of that style of heavy metal, if you like. It's one of the, the top four or five albums. And it's, a doubt. It's, it's five years late. That's the other thing, too. Yeah. I mean, the songs that are on it, it came out in 91, but the songs that were on it were written in 86 and 87. Yeah. And, and it's just like, so it's five, it's literally almost five years late that it should have, if it, if it had come out in 87, when Scream Bloody Gore came out, I really think it would have been, you know, it would have been completely on a different level, completely on a different level. It just sounds <laughs> like you've been, I know I understand too, because I'm, I'm clearly a musician, so I've been in bands too, but I'm the bassist and I do the financial mm-hmm. side of things and stuff, but you have to be trusting. You actually have no choice but to be trusting of people. And I understand why you've arrived at a point where you've got this misanthropic outlook on life because you've been fucked over and you've had people <laughs> from, from your perspective have burnt you. And it's I, same here, man. And it's, it's mm-hmm. tough, man, because you want to keep trusting. But when the same, like, you just get to a point where you just, you, you expect to be let down. You expect, yeah, that's, but, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's and, me. and you like, <laughs> that's me. but I mean, I think, I think from here on, I think from a, this fan's perspective, me, stay in that fucking driver's seat. Don't let anybody else in it, okay? No matter what you do from here on in, Massacre is Cam Lee. Whoever you surround yourself with, I understand you've got your brotherhood there with Mike, but, you know, these connections that you've got now with, with Scott Fairfax and the like, you've got some yeah. extremely capable musicians around that are capable of helping you realise this extraordinary vision that you've got. So I, I really hope... I know you've talked about not wanting to do this beyond, say, 60 or thereabouts or continuing into 70, but, mate, I just hope it's you're born again. I hope this is the beginning <laughs> all over again. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I guess I, I say that because I look realistically. I like – and like I said, I was being a smart ass a little bit too. Do I want to be like – like I remember speaking uh, of old age. I remember recently seeing – I'm a big uh, Misfits fan. You know, mm. so I'll always go try to see Glenn Danzig anytime he comes. And I remember the last time seeing him and I'm going, damn, Glenn's getting old. Yeah, I could just see <laughs> you could just see it on stage. He's thinning his hair, thinning in the back. And I'm like, I'm just looking and I'm like, yeah, Glenn's getting up there. He's getting old now. And uh, I think he's getting he's getting a little senile because <laughs> his, his, his movies that he's putting out is kind of uh, I don't think they're that very uh, good. Glenn, I don't know what's going on, but. I don't know. It's, and and um, I was just thinking that like and reflecting that back on me, I me mean, talking to my wife, because my wife's my best friend. I'm like, damn, I don't want to be I don't want to look like Glenn. Like, I hope people aren't seeing me like, you know, in my 60s and my, you know, hair is getting thinning in the back. And the, because you got those lights hitting on you, it's like yeah. you can see, you know, like it just I amplifies told wife, all of your negative characteristics, doesn't it? Yeah, I, said, I told something. my wife, I said, if it gets that bad, I said, you know tell me or so I can get some hair, you know, weaves or something in or so I just, just teasing with her so I can hide fake that. dreads, fake dreads. Like yeah, old Pete yeah. Sandoval's got, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, but I mean, so if I guess, you know, to, to make it all, it, it all depends on the, not the, I guess it depends on myself, my drive. Mm. Um, like I said, I, I definitely have two more albums, full length albums in me that I feel uh, that, that need to come out. Um, so I feel, and maybe that's the trilogy thing in me. 
I love, mm. I'm a big horror movie or big movie fan, and I I think of things in trilogies. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this is the this is even though this is the second album, this is literally the resurgence. So this is the first one, and I got another one in me, and one after. So it feels like that trilogy kind of fulfillment that I can get. So that's how I feel right now. I feel I've got two solid good albums worth of material in me and notes that I got sitting over here in this note this notebook full of notes that I have Beautiful. I've got five or six notebooks that in my room here that just have I take notes constantly uh especially like when I'm uh researching stuff I'll, I'll sit down and, and write notes and I've got list and list of song titles and ideas and stuff that I want to write about and express so I do have two, like I said, two solid albums in me. So I hope mm. to get those out and, and, and. Done. Well, maybe, maybe after those albums are done, I'm, I know it's getting on in time over there for you. It's probably quarter past 10, I suppose, is it in the evening and you've got to work tomorrow or what have you, but. Um, Actually it's the weekend. So I know, I don't. All <laughs> oh, right. Okay. I don't have to. Oh, yeah, it is yeah. too. It is too. It's Friday yeah. night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the. Yeah. Um, the idea of the book, I think, is a very good one. But now talking to you, I think you've got to get these albums out. Okay, because I think yeah. re-establishing, you know, when I say re-establishing the legacy, there was a perception right. of a legacy. You're re-establishing that the legacy is real. It's here. Mm-hmm. I think writing a book would be best after then, uh, after that happens, yeah. because then you, 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 you've you done it. You're there. I mean, nobody can say, well, you've released a book. Because this does happen. People sort of are on a precipice of something. They release it and going, all oh, this is ahead. Because well, you, inevitably you talk about these things in a book. And then it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it won't happen. I'm just saying it's as a oh yeah, I don't cue card I, to fate, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be. I don't want to be one of those guys that like makes all these promises and then they're like, "Hey, what happened?" You know, I read your book and oh, you were talking about all this stuff, and here it is, eight years later, and you're still not doing nothing. Yeah, I don't want to. Uh, I would never want that to happen. <laughs> yeah, because I think so, you got you got a very important story. There's two things that could be done. It could be done in the form like old fashioned literature, but the other thing too is is a documentary. Um, I've been thinking of documentary. I've I've been thinking how to do it. How could I do it? I don't want to do a documentary. Like I didn't watch the death documentary. I I can be honest. I didn't watch the damn thing. I haven't seen anything. I don't know how it went. I don't, but I heard a lot. Eric talks a lot in it. That's all I've heard. But I don't, I don't want to do something where I do feel a documentary is probably better because a lot of people don't read anymore. (laughs) It's like, you you know, you only get a certain amount. You only get a certain amount of attention span out of somebody. Um, but I don't want to do a documentary where it's just like, I'm actually having a problem now with nuclear blast. Uh, Jackie's always asking me, Hey, can you do this video for this? So we can release it this week on the website. I'm like, does it always got to be me? Can't we have some of the other band members do it? Yeah. So we had some of the other guys do it. This is just a funny joke. I just, this is funny, but it's not a joke, but it's funny. (laughs) I told them and Jackie told them, Hey, do the video horizontal. For some reason, my band members don't know what horizontal is. <laughs> so they did it all like yeah. vertical. And yeah. I was like, hey, we can't use this stuff. It needs to be in widescreen. And then all my guys just didn't want to do it over again. Or they just was like, this is all I'm getting. Like Mike only gives me like, I told Mike, it's got to be a minute or lo- so long. He gives me 20 seconds. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm like, Mike, come on, man. But I uh, I guess. Yeah. I, I Look, I, I understand your perspective, but I think. People want to hear from you, Ken. They actually do. People, you are you are one of those guys where people are like, I want to know more about you as a person. So you, you might disagree with me when I say this, but I think if you do a documentary, it actually has to be the Cam Lee documentary. And the reason for that is because you pretty much are massacre. So if you talk about massacre, that's when other people have an idea that they should be included as well. So mm-hmm. for example, Death by Metal. Why isn't Cam Lee in there? Why make it about Churchill right. Demon? You mm-hmm. should you should have been in that by rights, even if the, I, I, from memory I don't even think they talked about you, we, which is no. wrong. Which yeah, is- they, they 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 just like I said, they uh, Eric loves to just kind of like not even mention me and push me out of everything and 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 uh, yeah, so yeah, I wasn't even mentioned or brought up at all in that. From what I know, from what I've heard, from other people telling me, man, it's so unwrong. They didn't even talk about you or even mention you. And the, I was like, yeah, you know, I mean. Like half that stuff that came on, half of the songs are Scream Bloody Gore, Infernal Death, Evil Dead, Regurgitated Guts, which was originally called Curse of the Priest. Mm. I wrote those songs. It's like all Chuck did was take, he took and changed a little bit of the lyrics and changed it. But I mean, 
I'm the one that came up with those courses. I wrote the subject matter. I'm the horror fan. You know, that's why I say Scream Bloody Gore is the only real death metal album, because after that, it went off in its own thing. Um, it's not really death metal. Chuck's subject matter changed uh, as well. I mean, um, when we were Mantis, when we were death, I'm a big horror fan and I always have been. I love horror movies, especially 80s horror. So all that stuff was literally my ideas. It was Evil Dead was my idea. Uh, you know, Curse of the Priest, which is Regurgitated Guts, is based on the Fulci film, Gates of Hell or City of the Living Dead. Hmm. It's literally, I could tell you every single, what all the songs are literally based on. Infernal Death is based on a, a movie called Superstition, which is about a witch being burned. Um, Chuck, again, changed my lyrics, you know. So all the stuff is based on Scream Buddy Gore is all based on horror movies. And Chris as well, um, which I still, I've talked to Chris as, and for a long time. He's a big horror movie fan too. So he knew also a lot of the, the stuff, the horror references. What you about know, Chris? That, are you are you in touch? Chris Reifert, sorry. So yeah, um, yeah. Uh, are you I, in touch? Or? I was in touch with him a couple of years ago, but we kind of like fell off after after Killjoy died. It was really weird because I was really good friends with Killjoy for years, and then after Necrophagia. Killjoy died, great band. Yeah, yeah. I um, I I kind of like uh, Chris was one of the ones that kind of fell off like contacting me after after killjoy died which i i always thought that was kind of sad but i'm not a person i'm not going to pursue you if you stop talking to me i'm not going to chase after you hey man why are you talking to me anymore yeah, i'm not one of those guys same. yeah so it's, it's like i let him go off and do his own thing and he's got his own thing going but um yeah i was it it was um so it hasn't been since i guess killjoy died it's the last time i talked to chris um but I just recently got con contact again with Scott Carlson, which was that was pretty cool because I was talking to Scott for years and then we kind of fell off the wayside. And we're talking again. And then recently I said, you know, I want to massacre wants to do a, a repulsion cover, uh, which yeah, you're not supposed to know that. <laughs> and we did a repulsion cover and I was like, I don't know the lyrics to this song. And then uh, next thing I know, I, I said something on, on Instagram and next thing I know. I get an Instagram message straight from Scott with the lyrics. Here's the lyrics, man. I heard you were doing the song. That's really awesome. cool of you. Yeah. So he sends me the lyrics. So I was like, ah, cool. So yeah, we, we, we decided we're going to do a uh, repulsion cover. We've got some good stuff coming up still too. We've recorded a couple of cool covers. Uh, did a necrophagia cover, repulsion cover. Um, nice. And, uh, and evil dead. <laughs> With the proper lyrics, um, with my lyrics, my original lyrics. So we did the Mantis version of Evil Dead with the, mm -hmm. the original Mantis lyrics back in. Um, so we have that. It's actually all recorded. That's actually done. It's all recorded. So I was hoping we'll see uh, if Nuclear Blast will put it out. We, Nuclear Blast, got, we have a plan. There's a big plan. For, yeah. I, got the, I got the year plan of what's coming out. Uh, I don't know if you heard the live album as well. Uh, what, what, what happened with that? No, no. What happened? Uh, well, um, when Rick was in the band, we recorded the live album and uh, um, it was kind of sitting on it after he left. And uh, I told her, although I said, you know, that th that's done. It's recorded. It's literally there. And he's like, well, get with Chip, your lawyer, and see what you could do about getting the rights to it. And uh, so we, I paid Rick. I, I literally paid him. I, I, I got, you know, the lawyer, Rick won't talk to me. And the lawyer got in touch with Rick and said, Hey, we want the, you know, the rights to use your performance to, uh, you know, to release this. Um, and at first I didn't know if it was, should be released. I was like, should I go back? Should I keep backpedaling? But Geraldo really wanted it. He's like, I think it's great, man. We should just get it. So we got it. And he wants to release it next year. I don't know if I should attach it to something or if I should release it as just it by itself though a standalone it's a tough one yeah yeah it's honestly fan, fan in it, the perspective i have is fan investment isn't really all of that it, there's not a lot of great fan investment in live recordings mm -hmm. they um 
I don't and I think the reason for that is because of the YouTube thing, meaning that everybody can stand there with a phone camera, yeah. iPhone or Android device and film like top quality stuff. As I mentioned, I'm a huge Trey fan. So I've seen just seen hundreds of videos of his live performance with someone standing in front of him. And mm-hmm. the quality is, man, I mean, it's better than what desk recordings were sort of 20 years ago in some cases. Yeah. You can hear everything through these tiny little bloody speakers. So yeah. I, mean, I, I, you know, I'm so I don't I'm I'm not of a, in a position to give you advice, but my view on these sorts of things would be that just make it a thing for the fans. You know what I yeah. mean? However, however you do it, just make it for people like myself who who are in, yeah, in some mean, ways completists. You know, I didn't want to. Uh, you know, I didn't want like I said, I didn't want to back pedal. I guess because I didn't want it to be like ah oh, well. Uh, it, I didn't want it to be a negative thing. I didn't want people saying, oh, well, he's just going back because Rick's on it. And, and that, that's what I didn't want it to be that. And I told Geraldo that I said, look, I don't want it to be a negative thing. Um, but Geraldo really felt that it was cool to have and that we could always attach it to something, I guess, kind of like an extra bonus because it literally is from beyond live. Mm-hmm. It's the entire album. And it's the only time, one time and only time and last time. So it's the first and last time that has ever been performed back to back in order. It was, it literally is. It's, it's, and it's, and it's Rick on it. So yeah. it's Rick playing it, even though it's a lot messed up. <laughs> There's a lot of mistakes. It's still uh, from beyond, you know, in order, the entire album in its entirety. And it's the first and only time it's ever been played live. Who's the, who was the drummer? And, and um, that was Mike, Mike Mazzanetto. Mike Mazzanetto okay. was the drummer and, and, and Mike Borders on bass. It okay, was the so very Mike's first. It. It, yeah. It was the first show that we played. It was the Orlando show sold out show. And uh, it was recorded live. And um, it's, it's so that, that was a thing. It's like uh, we have that where uh, Geraldo was thinking about putting it out next year. And uh, I said, well, I was really wanting the album to come out next year. I don't want it to kind of. So maybe yeah, we'll a just tough one, Cam. Yeah, it's yeah, a tough one, mate. Yeah, because the Destruction released their live album when it went nowhere. Yeah, um, and that was the last one that Mike's on. You know, because Mike's gone off. Mike Sifringer is, is, is yeah. God knows where he is. You know, mm-hmm. these days, um, it's a tough one. I, I I think I like what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, you I would that? rather. I mean, it's. I would rather just have it be a bonus attached to the album or, or an EP or something, almost like it's like, a, like, here's the new, here's the new massacre. But for your, but by the way, if you guys care, here's this live stuff, you know, kind of attached to it. And there's a bonus like live album attached to it. Almost, I don't know. I don't know how to think about it. You but. know what to do. You know what to do with it. Make it a limited edition run on vinyl. Do it as a vinyl only if you can. If you can get them to do That's that for you. That's actually a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Do do that with a cassette version of it as well. Now yeah. I'd get that, like as a fan, because yeah. it's mm-hmm. special. It's a package, and you know, liner notes for you talking about some of the things that you've you've shared with me on this on on, on our. Yeah, I mean, now. I planned on doing liner notes for it because it's like I did. I I wanted to kind of just say, look, it is for the fans. It is for the for the for the hardcore fans. It is for it is fan service. I guess you could say. Uh, yeah. um, which I'm not going to shy away from that word because I think that resurgence is fan service as well. So, um, it, so that's how I look at it, but I'm more excited about the EP. Um, I'm excited of course about the album and then the follow-up EP. Cause like I said, I think the EP is sort of like, it's, it's the next level. Uh, it, it's, it's the haunting the chapel, if you, if you will. Yeah. Um, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So I really excited about the EP and I think, um, and it's like, actually, when I got, well, I remember, like I told you earlier, when we got the album done, I was like, why didn't I put that song on the EP? Or why didn't I put that EP song on the album? And I was like, but I guess it's cool that it's on the EP because it's such a yeah. strong, strong uh, song. And it's going to carry, I think it's going to carry the EP. Um, I, all the songs on the EP are strong. They're, they're really strong. They're, and they're bangers. They're like, they're, they're the really aggressive, more, more aggressive than the songs on the album. So, man, I can't really, wait to hear it. Yeah, I'm excited yeah. about it, brother. I, I better wrap things up, but um, okay. before I before I do, um, Australia, I mean, have you been down here and do you get much love? I have, us? I have not, and I want to come there so bad. <laughs> I have not been on that side of the planet. I want to, I want Australia. I want to hit New Zealand. I've never been to Asia. For a guy that's part Asian, I've never been to Asia, and it's <laughs> my dream to go to Asia, to go to Japan, to go to 
China, if, if it's even possible now with, with the way the world is, oh, God, uh, yeah. To, yeah. yeah to, to even go to even maybe Thailand or something, something like that, uh, Indonesia, something wherever they have shows. At. I don't know where they have shows. I know Indonesia has a pretty big scene, but I don't know if it's in the jungle. I don't want to be playing in no, the it's jungle. it's a huge scene. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you can go, go, to, go to Jakarta and, and Malaysia. I Actually, I just got hit up this morning too, and I've made this point so often, and you're a big influence behind this, but here I go. Heavy metal is a universal language, and here's, here's one proof, okay? Um, so I got hit up by a PR agency to, to interview young ladies, full hijab, Indonesian, mm-hmm. so devout Muslims, playing heavy mm-hmm. metal. Playing heavy metal, brother. That's awesome. I mean, that's awesome. crosses, cro- and, and you're a big part of making this happen. So that's why what you talked about, just to bring things full circle, with dis- it's so it's disappointing, it's shit. But you know, w- with your cultural heritage, mate, it lends into the fact that heavy metal is the un- is the universal musical language. You can go to, and I know this for a fact. You can go to Saudi Arabia, and there are fellas yeah. sweating it out, and what in the equivalent of a recording studio or a garage playing extreme metal, mm-hmm. heavy metal, whatever it might be. Every country, anywhere you go, you know how big you- massacre is in South America. You know, yeah, so yeah. all mm-hmm. cultural, all religious, all social. Okay, all of these boundaries. Heavy metal has a unique way of just crossing over them all. You know, yes. and we're all and we're all a community. And you know, you're you're one of the forefathers of that community, mate. And you need to be told that, you know. And Thank that you. needs to I be. I appreciate you know, that. I think I very much appreciate that. It's it, that actually makes me feel good. So when I do interviews like this and you know, there's it's they come off positive. It make does make I I'll go running to my wife after I get off just to tell her that what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well, it's um, important that you hear it, Cam. I think it's and I know I know you don't get it. I know, I speak to I've spoken to a few people in your position. You know, you know, Pete Sandoval and these you know, legends, face it, legends, mm-hmm. people who are very important to us. We don't know you, but we're your friends. You know what I'm saying? We've listened mm-hmm. to you for years. Right. And and it's important because, you know, we, we go through life. And I'm, I'm, I'm a father these days in my mid-40s, got a mortgage, got a job. You know, mm-hmm. I'm set. I'm doing well. But there were times in our life when we weren't. Mm-hmm. And music music is the bedrock of, of what helps us get through things, you know. Yep. And extreme metal for me was that thing. You know, it was it was odd for me. It was disco music, funk, and death metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Yep. laughs> you know, it wasn't fucking grunge and Kurt Cobain's fucking heroin addiction. I can no. tell you that now. I hated no. that shit. I still Yeah, I like did it. too. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I came, like I'm it. older. I'm older and I, I come from the old punk, you know, like, like I said, the Misfits is my favorite uh, because like, um, you know, I come from the old school punk and, you know, even the Ramones, I still go back and listen to my Ramones stuff. And I'm like uh, black flag mm-hmm. and, and dead Kennedys. And I'll go back and listen to that stuff. Cause that's my, that's my youth. You know, I was a skate punk before I even got into metal. And uh, so, you know, I, Yes, music in general, underground music, especially for me, you know, underground music is more real to me than than the stuff that's on the radio, stuff that's popular. I hate radio stuff, radio is crap. Uh, and that's why I don't like rock stars. I don't like it because it's not real to me. It's 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 gimmick. I actually, OK, this may hurt you. I've, I've talked to a lot of metal people. Like, I am not a kiss. I am not a kiss fan. Neither am I. <laughs> I fucking hate him. I hate kiss. So I don't get it. Th- there's a, di- there's a, there's a division. If there's a polarized division in metal, there's your kiss fan and then your non kiss fan. So the kiss fan is usually the ones that like the gimmick. And I, I've, I've told this, I've gotten good kiss fans. It's like, can you fucking tell me a good song they've written since the seventies? I mean, they live off of shit that's from the seven. And that song, that shit wasn't even that good. <laughs> I mean, literally, they've been around for, they only live on the gimmick. That's all they are is a gimmick. So I have a problem with that as being a musician myself is like, they suck. And they're a gimmick. They only survive off their gimmick. Gene Simmons is a genius for that shit. Other than that, it's shit. It's horrible. It's just a gimmick. And, and I guess that's the separation. There's the polarization. Kiss fan, non-Kiss fan. I'm on the non-Kiss fan side. <laughs> well, their, their best album, in my view, is the Bruce Kulick stuff, you know, with um, yeah, like yeah. Carnival of Souls from 1996, I think it was, when they didn't sound like Kiss. They just sounded like a gnarly fucking rock and roll band. They yeah. just they, they lost a lot of that 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 pantomime aspect and mm-hmm. they, they lent into the actual real music side of things rather than the, the dramatisation. Look, yeah, the Kiss thing. I don't look. I don't get it either. And I can tell you, mate, I have worked hard to like Kiss. I can't do it. I can't. They're huge in Australia. <laughs> I, can't, I can't. I can't. Yeah, I, I don't can't. get it. I don't understand uh, it. You know, it's you know the the the. I've spoken to um, 
Peter, uh, Chris, about it. We ended up talking more about his pre-kiss band. I can't remember what they're called now, but yeah, he's, you know, I, I think I recognise their place as influences and, and inspiration for so much of what I love. Mm. But in terms of the band themselves, yeah, it's it's quite weird, actually. Some of the fans here in Australia, they get dressed up and all of the shit and it's like, you're a yeah, full-grown yeah. man, get over it. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I've never, I'm, uh, and, you know, that might be a reason why I don't get along with some of the ex-members of Massacre because they were all <laughs> Kiss fans. And I'm like, ah, this shit is horrible. I, I mean, I would, I would just to sit there and just, and they did get mad at me. I remember them getting upset with me. Like, what do you mean, man? Just, we grew up with this stuff. This stuff. I'm like, yeah, well, I grew up with the Misfits and, and you guys think that sucks. But, you know, whatever. And the Ramones, which, yeah, it sucks. It's, it's simple. It's easy. But it's it's more memorable than Kiss. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. That's, that's just oh, there's, there's a ton of bands. So, I mean, I've come around to bands like Soundgarden and the like. But, I mean, when you're a young fella and you're listening to Morbid Angel, Soundgarden aren't going to do it for you. No, <laughs> no. Gonna say, no or Deicide. I mean, it's you're yeah. listening to Deicide, Massacre, Morbid Angel, Cannibal Corpse, Obituary, At the mm-hmm. Gates, all of this sort of stuff. And then someone puts on Soundgarden, mate. It, it, I'm not saying it sounds like a nursery rhyme. It clearly doesn't. But it's taken me decades to get my head around appreciating what these huge rock bands are all about. And even then, I still, I, I still don't like them. So I mean, you're 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 closer to me. You're closer than I am because I still can't stand that stuff. I can't stand it. I listen to I like you. You know, you're at work. I work construction a lot, and then these construction guys will put on that stuff like Soundgarden, or they'll put on Pearl Jam, and I'm like, God, this fucking stuff is fucking grinding. I'll go and make noise just so I can just drown it out, just because it's like, ah, oh, oh, it's fucking, Pearl Jam's Pearl Jam's uh, horrible. Oh, I fucking yeah. hate that stuff. I, especially nine. I don't know something about that '90s shit. I can't stand. But I would, you know, purposely go and put on, you know, like death metal. <laughs> These guys are always just like, "What the fuck are you listening to?" I'm like, stuff that's better than your shit. That's <laughs> like, yeah. So yeah, I play yeah. I play covers, and and about 10, 15 years ago, we were playing a lot of that stuff by Killers and Kings of Leon and all that sort of shit. Mm-hmm. And that was the rock music of the time. Oh my god. <laughs> talk about droney dreary shit you know yeah. and it's tough man because you and like that's why i think that's why as a young filler and and right the way through i started leaning into some james brown and all of that sort of stuff you know it's funk oh, yeah, soul, yeah. disco music chic bernard edwards and nile rogers yeah. musicianship is off the charts and i was like i i i i, I identify with this stuff far more than i mm-hmm. do with this you got to talk i mean this is what gives me the shits about yeah, this whole idea that rock and roll is a white white people artifact. It's not. It was invented <laughs> by black people. Yes. It's yep. black music. It's just been appropriated to a great extent by the white corporate culture, if you like, mm-hmm. and put putting a lot of people, a lot of white guys into bands. When rock and roll, I'm not saying, I'm not, it's, it's not about who does it better or what have you, but rock and roll has got a swing. It's got a groove and none of those bands yes. swing and groove. None of them do. Yep. Sorry, that's my, my view on things. You know, that's why yeah. I love 24 7 Spies and Fishbone and Living yeah. Color, uh, King's mm-hmm. X. It's got a swing, it's got a groove, it's got some funk. You know what I mean? It keeps on going. And, and, th- and then on the other side of that, you know, th- there was some, th- all of the extreme metal stuff too, like with From Beyond, some of that stuff swings. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know exactly well, yeah, what I'm talking I know, about. I, hey, I know. I mean, uh, one of the biggest songs we have is Defeat Remains. And that is not mm-hmm. a death metal song at all, it is literally a rock song. It's a rock song with death metal vocals, but I mean, it's, it's dancey. I, actually, Mike Borders hates it. <laughs> I'm like, Mike, we have to play it. That's the, that's one of the fan favorites. It really mm. works. People love that song. Um, and Rick didn't write that song. Nope. Uh, Robbie no. Goodwin wrote that song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you can tell, you can tell it's not a Rick song, but yeah, it's, it's uh, so I get it. And I try to do that too with, uh, I try to be groove, have a groove. Um, have There's a, no doubt. Yeah. I, have I, I try to have a hook. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was talking to Trevor Perez about this, and he mentioned that when he played, you know, Trevor from Obituary, obviously. Yeah. Um, when he played Obituary to his grandmother, she said, "I don't understand a word you're saying, but I can dance to this." And I thought, "Amen, sister. I know exactly yeah, yeah. what you're talking about." Yeah. Because I felt I've yeah. long felt that it's got a swing, it's got a groove, and it, it's got something that makes you sort of want to do this sort of thing. It doesn't mm-hmm. happen with all that grunge shit it, or, or mm-hmm. an alternative music, which is just about playing across the groove. You, yeah. you know what I'm yeah. talking about. It's oh, yeah. Of, it forgets that there's a bass drum there and there's a bass, there's a bass guitar mm-hmm. there that sort of can lock in with the bass drum. None of that stuff happened with those bands. Well, I also feel that, I mean, I'm not, I say the same stuff about super technical death metal, which I call math death metal, the stuff that sounds oh, yeah. like it's a math equation. And, I mean, I appreciate the musicianship, but 
five minutes later, I can't tell you what the fuck I just heard. I don't, it's not, I'm not humming the riff. And I try to think that, you know, Massacre is like you get done with the Massacre album and there's some riff that is still sticking with you, that it's still staying with you. I mean, I know so many people that just can never, it's the simplest riff in the world, but people love to play Dawn of Eternity. That opening mm-hmm. riff is just something that's just so simple. I mean, Cradle did it. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's one of those songs that just seems to be like one of them. That and Corpse Grinder. And Corpse Grinder is a fucking uh, original death song that goes back to when we were in death. And it's wow. the simplest thing. It's it's three fucking chords, I think, uh, three 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 measures, you know. And that's mm. it's but it's that kind of simple, simplistic, what I call meat and potatoes death metal that kind of sticks with you, that makes because it has something that you 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 remember and you can kind of like you said groove to or you kind of you know tap your feet to you know and it, mm. and and that hook is what I've always tried to kind of bring into. I've had negative i've had these younger kids that are all negative uh, uh these you know pig squealing you know guttural vocal guys going yeah yeah you know they're like oh you know you, you keep saying the same thing i'm like if you knew anything about music it's called a chorus you know it's like you know that's you know that's music you know it's it, it you repeat the, the same thing because it's a hook that's what p- pulls you back in and you know there are these guys are like all like and they fight the, to me. There's I'm a vocalist, but I'm also was a drummer. So I write my vocals. You were, almost. and you did play drums in death. People don't realize yes. that in Mantis. People don't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I write my lyrics probably like a drummer. Um, and I see these other vocalists in death metal that kind of write their lyrics against the music, almost to a point where it's like they're fighting the music like there's too much going on or there's no groove to the pattern or their intonation is different um mm. i guess i write like a drummer so i write still how if i was playing the drums how would i be able to do the vocals if i was playing the drums so it has those pauses and that sort of intonation in between um because i write to the drums more than i write to the guitar riff and i'm definitely not one of those vocals that write a uh, shit ton of lyrics and then try to fit it to a song. I don't do that. I actually write my lyrics to the music because wow, okay. I know there's a lot of vocalists that just write. Oh, I've got fucking a book of songs and I'm just going to read whatever I have these lyrics over this music. And as you can almost tell, it doesn't fit. It almost goes against it. It's like, it's like, man, why are you saying this line? that's 20 words long in a, in this space that really only five words should fit in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, and then you're just mumbling it anyways and incoherently you can't understand what you're saying anyway. So it's, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you absolutely on your point about those tech and math metal bands, you know, like um, I'm not shitting on Rings of Satin or Archfire right. at all. Cause I've spoken to those guys and good guys. Um, but the bands are sort of just beneath them that don't have their originality that are quantizing the living shit out of their material and pro tools. Yeah. And you listen yeah. to it in headphones. It's just, a, it's an onslaught. It actually, to a point, affects your middle ear and makes you feel a bit sick because mm-hmm. there, it's, there's no space like what Metallica did in Death Magnetic. It's yeah. just all, it's just, when you line it up in, I see it in, in um, Premiere Pro. If I put it in yeah. there, you can yeah. see there's, you can't see the little jagged bits in the yep. wave file, the sound file that indicates mm-hmm. there's things going on. It's, it's musical. It just looks like someone's going ah! yeah. in, into yeah, a microphone exactly. and, it, and it has the same effect on you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. But um, mate, thank you so much for this. I just generally yeah, I, release everything as it is, you know, it's up. Uh, yeah. If you're comfortable <laughs> with that. I, I mean, I, I mean, there's a couple of things, you know, you know, mentioning the, past members and mentioned Eric, you know, and of course, again, it's not anything to, to, you know, say, you know, anything slanderous or liable against anybody. It's just my opinion of how things have been and how I've been treated and how I feel. Like I said, I've never met Eric face to face. I'd love to, I'd love to sit across from him face to face and just say, what is your problem with me? Just tell me. Straight up. This could be a catalyst for it too, though. You never know. Yeah. I mean, that's why yeah. that's why these long form look as Joe Rogan can can you know the success of Joe Rogan, long form conversation helps people yeah. understand things and it demystifies uh, your perspective yeah. on things. And um, this conversation here, mate, I think it will correct some misconceptions, um, mm-hmm. and it, I think it allows you to cut to the heart of the matter, which is that 
let's face it, Massacre is your band. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. And that's all that needs to be told. And and all these other people that you've mentioned, they're just, they've played a role, okay? And they've played an important role in some cases, like Rick. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think, like I, again, like I said up the top or thereabouts, you know, your, your contribution as one of the originators of the death metal vocal style. See, Jeff Becerra is on this crusade trying to convince everybody that he's the guy who invented it. I agree with him at the time when I had a chat to him, but on hindsight, I don't agree with him, to be quite honest with you. I think he took it right to the line. I think you were the guy that actually took it over the line and then that was the inspiration for Chuck to popularise it. I think you're the missing link, brother. I think you are. Thank you. Thank you. And and I think... think It's good to hear people actually... It's good to hear people like yourself, and you know, see that. Uh, it's it's nice for me. It really does. Like I said, I want to run off when we get done and say, tell my wife, man, this he's this, this guy knew. <laughs> you know, it's like it, it makes me feel good. You know, and uh, you know, it does. It really does make me feel good. You know, it, it's it it does. It, it it's good. It's good to hear that. My pleasure. I, I, yeah. You know. Well, no, it's important. It's important, mate. Life. I, I've said this a, a lot too on the podcast, mate. You know, we're all human. Um, life is long, life is tough, life can be shit. We get very few moments where we truly are in the moment. You know, we're mm-hmm. meant to, you listen to all these fucking podcasts and these these motivational speakers as they be in the moment, meditate. And you're like, I fucking can't do that. I've got two kids that are screaming at me. I've got yeah. a boss who's yelling at me for something else that was due yesterday. You know, I've got got five or six bills here. As an, oh, I'm a functioning adult. There's no failure mm-hmm. to launch here as there isn't with you, mate. We're functioning members and participating members of society. You know, I mean, being in the moment is something that might happen once we're dead. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but right now, mate, we've got the music and you're a big part of that. You're a big part of the reason why I love the music I love. So thank you for making it. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. The great Cam Lee, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed that one. I certainly enjoyed having the chat with him. If you like that one, there are many more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. If you could like, subscribe, and share, that'd be great too. And if you could leave a comment, that'd be even better. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it is a very goodbye for now.